also learned from another producer that I worked with, like he would just sit intently with his eyes closed, listen to it fully and not visualize. You'll make some crazy edit these days that you're like, like ah, that doesn't sound right to me, you know? And it, it comes down to like you looking at it. Like if you see the edit happening, then you're, it freaks you're you out. Yeah, and you're screwed. But like the minute you turn the computer off and like just listen, listen to the speakers, you're like, the edit's totally fine. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. You may already know that using true analog gear is one of the best ways to create a great record. Yet increasingly, we live in a digital world, recording and mixing inside the computer. So what if you could have the best of both worlds? Tegeler Audio Manufacturer is bridging the analog-digital divide by creating high-end analog gear like the Schwerkraft Maschine compressor and the Raumzeit Maschine reverb whose knobs you can control remotely using a plug-in in your DAW. Or their many analog units like the Cream Bus Compressor with Mastering EQ or the Very Tube Recording Channel that let you save your settings using a custom recall sheet plugin, offering a complete line of pro audio gear from compressors to EQs to reverbs and beyond. Now you can get a pro analog sound while benefiting from the power of digital. Let your DAW help you move your knobs so that your music can move you. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about Tegeler Audio Manufactor. Hey, rock stars! It's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Chris Harden, a Chicago based producer, engineer, and mixer and guitar player. Starting out as a musician embracing the four-track tape machine, he later became a partner at IV Lab Studios. That's not four lab. It's not like Roman numeral four. Is no, it? no, like letter I, letter V. Okay, all right, yeah. cool. So I'm, I'm right there. All right, groovy. <laughs> and uh, Chris has recorded and or produced over 100 records in his 12 years behind the console, getting his start as assistant engineer on the Grammy-nominated Plain White T single, Hey There Delilah, that one, right? <laughs> yep. Chris went on to work with Rachel Yamagata, nice, the Von Bondies, Gary Lewis of the Jayhawks, Wayne Baker Brooks, and supergroup Hardworking Americans, which involves one of our East Nashville natives, Todd Absolutely. Snyder, right? Todd Snyder, yeah. Yeah, groovy. Chris's production credits include Miracle Condition, District 97, Like Pioneers, and Chicago Farmer, and he continues to perform locally with The Pod, a ween cover band, very cool, and, <laughs> and tour nationally with the Ike Riley assassination. And he also tours as a live sound engineer and is a member of the Recording Academy. So, dude, I'm very excited to have you here. Thanks rock for stars, me. please welcome Chris Harden to Recording Studio Rockstars. Chris. That's a pleasure, Lich. Thank you. Are you ready to rock? I am ready to rock. Sweet, dude. <laughs> well, you know, I've given an introduction, but Tell us a little bit more about who you are in your own words, and um, kind of tell us, how'd you get into this recording thing? Uh, sure. I mean, uh, like anyone else, it started as a, a musician. Um, when I was a young kid, uh, uh, I was picking up the guitar in like fourth grade, and uh, then also uh, playing in like a uh, middle school band. Um, and at one point, I, I decided to uh, cash in the, the middle school band thing. It really wasn't. Uh, I was much more interested in the guitar. Yeah, I think, your, I think your bio said something about like, I started learning guitar, but then I traded in my trumpet for a four track, right? <laughs> I did. I, I went to the music store and traded in my, my trumpet I was using for middle school band and uh, bought a four track tape. Oh, machine. that's awesome. So you literally, <laughs> it was like trade the trumpet for a four track. Did that ever make it as a lyric into one of your songs? Uh, no, I don't think it did. But <laughs> might be pretty good. I can't stop thinking about lyrics these days because uh, I'm trying to get, get to be a better songwriter myself. Absolutely. Yeah. Lyrics are important. I also do not like writing lyrics. It's uh, It makes me insane. So I, I choose to write music and have other people write lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> Lyric writing is a funny thing. 
I totally enjoy it. I just don't like it when it feels like work. I, I feel like it always feels like work. <laughs> I, I love it if, if the natural thing I might say turns out to be a good lyric. And, but. and you know, I'm not doing a whole lot of songwriting these days, but uh, when I did, uh, I, I felt like everything that I wrote was too literal. Like it would just right. be like, I'm going to the park and then now I'm going over here. And, uh, but yeah, that's long, long since been gone. Uh, I do have a project that where I do have kind of my Bernie Taupin who writes the lyrics and, and I get to write the music. And Wait, what you said you have your what? I have a project that I do musically that, uh, where I kind of have a Bernie Taupin it's called atypical science. Um, and where I get to write all the music and then, uh, my cohort, uh, Justin Shroff gets to write all the lyrics and he's a, a brilliant lyricist. I so. kind of have that too. So, oh, there we go. So rock stars, <laughs> here a little preface to this. We decided since it's such a beautiful day out to just leave the door to the control room wide open. So you're probably going to hear the sounds of East Nashville. And that was the train horn happening. It's, it's gorgeous in Nashville today. I don't know why we would close the door. We'll see what, we'll see what leaks through the mics. You know, you might hear some <laughs> birds or maybe my noise cancellation mixing techniques are too good, you know? Um, um, so yeah, it was kind of that. I uh, got a four track tape machine, um, played in some bands, did that thing like everybody does. And I was I grew up in Northwest Iowa, really small town of about twelve thousand people. Uh, it was pretty cool. Uh, uh, Lake Okaboji. So it's uh, uh, one of uh, like ten Clearwater Blue Lakes in the world. Uh, it's kind of a tourist destination. Our our population will go from twelve thousand in the winter to over a hundred thousand in the I'm summer. I'm sorry, what what state was that again? Uh, it's in Iowa, Northwest in Iowa. Iowa, okay, Iowa great. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, we, it was great cause we had, uh, some venues in town that, uh, had, na we had a national booking agent. So I got to see music that was just incredible and played in a band there from Iowa for, uh, for a long time. And we bought a 1972 motorhome and toured around and nice. did that sort of thing. You know, it was, it was a lot of fun and, uh, and then decided that I wanted to get out of small town, Iowa and move to Chicago. So my sister was living in Chicago uh, and she had an open room, uh, in her apartment. And I basically just decided to check it out, go move to Chicago, see what would happen. And in, in my idea, I would be in, in like, uh, the greatest rock and roll band in, in like a week. And of course, you know, <laughs> like, and that doesn't happen. So we started like, my sister plays music too. And we would play open mics and, and started to meet people. And, Wait, what, uh, what season of the year did you move to Chicago? I think in the middle of winter. Yeah. In the, okay. So but spring it, was on its way. It so was there was a good way. chance you would get out there and meet some folks. Yeah. Otherwise I it, imagine you're looking at like four to five months of just staying alone <laughs> in your apartment, you know? Well, a little bit, but there's uh, I mean, in the winter, a lot of stuff happens in Chicago. There's uh, we don't have a choice. Yeah. You so. turn the heat up. Yeah. You go to a club. Windows, yeah, yeah. You go to a, a small little bar in the neighborhood and, and we started an open mic there and uh actually let's, let's let's talk about that for a sec so that's yeah. one of the things i really admire about chicago is it's a place that truly like deeply appreciates the idea of a corner neighborhood bar right it's amazing i mean i moved in and there was this little place on the corner called sylvia's and uh sylvia was a serbian woman about 70 years old so it wasn't sylvia massey it wasn't it was not <laughs> all right <laughs> um and sylvia became like my chicago mom like when i like had problems or wanted to like get things off my chest, I'd go to the pub that was, uh, you know, a block away from my house and, and talk to Sylvia and, and, uh, kind of started an open mic with, uh, like four or five friends that I'd just met in that neighborhood. Like everyone lived within like a four block radius and, and, uh, it was just a whole lot of fun. We, we started playing music. We would, uh, we would challenge each other. Like my friend Aaron and I, Aaron was a great songwriter. I, unbelievable. Uh, and we would like do a thing where, okay, we have to write two songs by next week. And if, oh, that's great. And when you come in, uh, then we'll kind of just like, t uh, I don't think we ever really took a vote, but it was just kind of like a challenge to like, okay, you got to come in with, with two new songs. Two songs by next week is hard, man. It's really hard. So we would, and, and they pushed me to do that. And it was great. Um, so I did that. Uh, I had to find a job because I moved to Chicago. So I ended up in the coffee industry, um, uh, kind of lying on a resume saying I managed a bunch of stuff and uh, <laughs> ended up managing uh, some coffee shops uh, on the DePaul campus, uh, which is okay, a college cool. there in Chicago. And so I was uh, running a juice bar and a coffee shop there. I did that for about a year and realized that that's not what I wanted to do for the rest of my life and decided to uh, go to school for recording engineering. So Okay, cool. Um, so, so sort of going to Chicago out of the thrill of wanting to play music and be in a band and like, you know, get some sort of break or just make it happen. But then discovering that maybe this was more of a, a, a some, a profession that might need some study or like, <laughs> sure. You know, yeah, absolutely. Into. And I think 
Uh, the big thing that really turned me on about recording, I, of course, having a four track at home and stuff was great. Um, but then uh, my band from Iowa went up to Pachyderm Recording Studios in Minnesota, yeah. like Nirvana did in utero yeah. there, yeah. and PJ Harvey did Rid of Me, Soul Asylum did everything there. It was a, my first uh, entrance into a, a real recording studio, and we had a great time. They gave us like an awesome indie rate. We worked with this guy, Brent Sigmuth, who's still kind of kicking around up there a little bit, uh, and we did uh, basic tracking in one day overdubbing in one day and mix. So we were in and out of that studio in three days. That's uh, great. That's a lot of fun. It was great. And what what sort of band did you take up there? Um, the band, the, it was my band from Iowa. We were kind of in the sublime realm, you know, of the the uh, later 90s. We, we had a DJ. We had, uh, you know, so we were doing kind of punk rock, kind of like ska kind of stuff. Nice. <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a ton of fun. And seeing Brent work, uh, I think that was my first idea of being like, wow. Like what to be on that side of the glass and like. So know. what year was that? So you guys were probably still using tape at that point. Or? We absolutely did yeah. the entire record to you know on the Studer. Um, yeah, I think it was ninety eight, ninety nine. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. dig it. And then um, shortly after that, the music business fell apart, and <laughs> and you and your band had a long discussion. <laughs> now, what talk? Maybe talk about that that uh, that era and that time and like. You know, uh, you went to recording school next. I did. Um, yeah. So I then I went to Chicago, was there for a year, and then decided to go to recording school. Um, so yeah, when I went to recording school, everything was based, I mean, we had Pro Tools Labs, but uh, all the studios were wired for the two-inch analog tape. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So we were learning on the, on the two-inch machine. Yeah. Um, and then I believe you said one of your teachers was Kevin Becker, who's also been on the podcast. He has been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's so down he here in around, Yeah, and... It was just all, it was so cool, man. Uh, Cause I, at that point, it was like, am I going to college? What am I going to do? And of course, Columbia College was in Chicago that has a recording program. And I really enjoyed going to the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences where I went in, in Phoenix, Arizona. It was a nine month program where we just focused on recording. Uh, so it wasn't like you had to take math or science. I, I don't think at that point in my life, I was really interested in like, trying to get better at English. You know, I don't know. It was yeah. just like I was focused on I wanted to learn how to record music. Uh, yeah. Um, and it was great. We spent so much time in the studio there. I was obsessed. Uh, we had free studio time there, of course. And and uh, we had a small uh, group of – you're with 12 people there at the uh, conservatory when I went there. And we basically had an, a great band out of our class. So we would just constantly uh, – I remember I worked at a – we'd go to school from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., then I worked at a, a brewery and, and pizza place from like four till nine. And then I'd go back to the studio from like 10 until three in the morning and then do it all over again. That's day. awesome. Man. <laughs> you know, it's one of the things I remember about starting recording schools. By the time I decided that that's what I want to do, it was sort of like a shift for me in life that is the first time I ever knew what I wanted to do. Yeah. And once you know what you want to do, Man, it's so easy to just pour yourself into it, you know. But totally. when you when you just don't know, or you're just kind of like dabbling around, you know, you can get into stuff, um, but it's more like fits and spurts, you know. And and I was a little older too, so like I feel like going to recording school at that point, uh, I was a hundred percent focused. It wasn't like I was wanted to party or wanted to, you know. I'd kind of gotten that out of my system as traveling around in bands and and doing that when I was younger and. And was just extremely focused on like learning this craft and, and, and the rest of the people in my class were also, uh, I just had a brilliant class of people, uh, some who I still keep in contact with. Uh, so I, I think you just said this, but the, the school you were at was conservatory in Phoenix. Yeah. The conservatory crass? of, Re yeah. Crass. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I actually have had some of my uh, best interns have come from there. In the past <laughs> awesome. Too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that was really cool about uh, the interns that would come from Crass is that they would finish classes and they would just be doing an internship. So for a month or two or whatever it was, the only thing they had to do every day was be in the studio and intern, sure. which I think is a great way to do it because you really immerse yourself in it all. And you I do to, too. And to the best it. interns that we have at Ivy Lab do that. They're yeah. not the ones that are just kind of like, oh, we'll work. We'll be there one day a week. It's the ones that are like, uh, we will immerse ourselves in it and be there. And it's still not, when I got done, it was like, I, uh, that's, I guess, moving on forward in the story. But, uh, uh, I was at the studio 24 hours a day, like after right, I got done at the, right. the conservatory. I had no choice. I was just going to be there. I was the only intern. <laughs> there you go, man. And so you were interning now back in Chicago? I was. Uh, so when I came back to Chicago, a uh, really great friend of mine, uh, Nick Nipomiachi, uh, introduced me to Manny Sanchez, who was just kind of starting Ivy Lab Studios. He okay, had, cool. uh, 
he had worked at uh, CRC, Chicago Recording Company, a big studio in Chicago, and also at Gravity Studios, and then decided to open his own place. So um, when I got there, uh, we had a, a big concrete room, and we're starting to build the place out. So, I mean, I did everything from drywall to to wiring, no, helping wire. I was on the worst solder in the world, but uh, <laughs> like watching, and, and uh, we had this guy, Bruce Breckenfeld, who's we call Yoda in Chicago. He's the head tech at CRC, Chicago Recording Company, and uh, kind of designed our room and helped us out in, in the uh, building of our first room. We're now at a new space, but this was our, our first room that we had okay, cool. that, that Manny had started. And it was real cool. It was in an uh, old bank vault. So literally, as you walked into the, the studio, there was a 1,500, 2,000-pound door that was a giant bank door with the big twirly thing on, you know, the big, nice. Uh, so yeah, you walked into the studio and, uh, that was our, were there dead gangsters like leaning up skeletons. We've heard a lot of stories that this building had some, uh, some mobster activity. (laughs) None none have been confirmed, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was, we found out later it was like an old commodities vault. So they would store furs and jewels. Oh, interesting. And, and it was big enough to have a a control room and three booths and a live room, uh, a little smaller than our, I imagine. Yeah. Well, after we, after we, well, you had three feet of concrete around you so a pretty good <laughs> soundproofing just right well, so there. what were some of the um uh construction tips that you remember about constructing a studio for the first time what were the things that you learned where you're where you realized like this is what was needed to make a studio happen uh, i guess a lot of it was parallel walls of course um no no don't, you got to get more specific than that <laughs> well i mean it was because we had a, everybody's going to go away going oh well we have to have parallel walls <laughs> non-parallel walls <laughs> okay good good so maybe explain that a little bit um yeah so bruce had kind of designed the room where uh we would take this concrete square that we had uh and angle some walls and and then inside the walls built base traps with uh uh sound soaking insulation inside of them hanging off of uh uh uh, hooks inside this false wall that was there that would angle in in the studio so that it would uh suck up some of the base in the small room right so false wall means it was probably fabric or something that the sound could go through it well it was a full wall and then had a hole in it uh, about the size of a door and then inside that would be hanging uh, insulation. That like would, the size of a closet or the size of another small room? Or uh, about the or? size of a closet, yeah. It wasn't huge. Um, and, and the hanging insulation is like, um, how, how would we describe that? It's like if you um, fold it up, uh, I want to... Th- I want to think of like a meat lock or something like meat hanging up to dry or like pretty much like that. Like it would be, it would though, be like a it? piece of plywood with uh, insulation on either side and then hanging on, on just hooks. suspended in the just air. Suspended, and yeah. part of the idea is that that sound can travel into that space and kind of get and up. and there's easily go in there, but it just gets quiet. It, it just trapped. deadens down and yeah. trapped and doesn't come back out. And, I mean, that was a lot of it. And then just different baffles on top of the ceiling that were like angled uh, from the top of the ceiling down to the wall, also with uh, insulation that would be angled inwards. I'm, I'm, I'm like, sh- I'm showing you here <laughs> yeah. visually, but it's hard to describe. Uh, Sorry, the mystery is killing all the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just different acoustic treatments, um, building troughs rather than, you know, we had a concrete wall, so we couldn't really put the, uh, the wiring inside the wall. So right. Building troughs around the studio that would uh, then get wired up to uh, different patch points for XLR connections. And- so a trough might be, was it literally down in the, the bottom corner of the room? Exactly, yeah. So, so uh, Rockstars, if I'm picturing it right, a trough is like saying, you know, you've got the corner of the room, the wall comes down, the floor goes over, but you sort of build it out. Like imagine one of those... Um, uh, what do they call it? Like the channels up on the ceiling where the ductwork's running through. Of course. But, but it's down on the ground. Yeah. And you can lift the top off the thing. It's very and then easy, it's just yeah. this open thing where all the cables are running through. And exactly, it just makes yeah. it nice and neat and sort of out of the way. You could Once it's closed up, you can set your beer on it, right? You can, yeah. I, hmm. I mean, it was very low, though. I'm talking like it was like three inches off the ground. So you, if you wanted to lean down and pick up your beer, you can. All right. <laughs> um, so let's uh, explain to the rock stars also why you don't want parallel walls in a studio. Um, Just because uh, sound doesn't like to bounce back and forth. Well, we don't like the way sound bounces back and forth from wall to wall. If it's parallel, it's just going to continue to go from wall to wall, where if you have angled walls, it's going to slowly disperse by hitting one wall and going Bouncing in different away, directions. Yeah. So, um, Rockstar, is that if you have two parallel walls, 
you get what's called a flutter echo. So if you sure. were to um, go into any room, you've got a, of course, if you already know this, then this is like a dumb <laughs> moment. But if you haven't tried this yet, go into any room that's got two parallel walls in it, um, an office room or something with hard walls, and just clap your hands. And if you listen right there, you get that proing, proing yeah, sound. It's almost like a slapback. Huh? Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. a really fast, boingy sound. And that's the slapback. And if you had somebody else, you know, if you stay in the same spot and you had somebody just like hold up a couch cushion against one wall right next to you and then you clap your hands again, you'll notice it, it immediately goes away. Dissipates. Too. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Okay, awesome. All right. So um, <laughs> yeah, where, where how <laughs> about how about like the the big questions that I think a lot of people have about like um, confusion between sound uh, um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like sound um, control in in a studio where the, it's sound transmission, like where it's soundproofed, as in sound doesn't travel through the walls, versus you know sound treated, where it's actually sounds good in the room. Sure, I mean in that instance, yeah, we're still talking about our old space uh, Ivy Lab, uh, yeah, or, was... or the new one. Just like I mean, if you've been through a few of these, you know, you might have learned. Sure, sure and uh, uh, on the our, in our new place, uh, it was a studio for many many years before we moved in. So we kind of just did some remodeling and and uh, and and made it our own. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're in a freestanding building, of course it's great because you don't really have to worry about the sound getting out or bothering other right, people. Right, if it goes out a little yeah. bit, who and, cares? And at that our was... old location, we did have to worry a little bit about that because we had apartments above us, and you know we had to make sure we weren't recording drums at four o'clock in the morning. I, sometimes two o'clock yeah. would be fine, but, <laughs> but got some complaints it is here. It's Chicago and after all. Got, we got some late. complaints here and there. And, uh, actually at that time, as committed to the studio as I was, like I moved into the apartment above it. So that would kind of like help alleviate some of the complaints from other people. But nice. um, we got evicted from an apartment in Chicago for making records at all hours of the day. Really? <laughs> I mean, we deservedly got evicted. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, people don't typically like that if they're trying to go to sleep. No, and they, they had every reason in the world not to like us. But <laughs> we had a, we had a record to make. We were dedicated. <laughs> That's awesome. And that was with some friends that you guys just set up a shop. In uh, that was with the band Atrixo, which later became um, uh, Lillian from that band, started his band, L The Living Things. Okay. But Atrixo was a first major label record that, that I was producing – Oh, signed awesome. to Hollywood Records, which yeah. uh, was there was Hollywood somewhere in your credits too? Hollywood Records or somebody? Or, maybe Possi I'm maybe possibly. I just uh, that. Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure. Maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, so you got sound transmission. You want to like you don't want the sound from the street coming in. Or you don't want the sound you're making leaving the studio exactly. and bothering anybody. Yeah. Um, and then you've got sound treatment in the space where you like the flutter echo stuff where you just exactly. don't want the sound well, to make to yeah to make wrong. your room sound sound good. <laughs> yeah. All right, well cool. That's cool that we kind of touched on those. This isn't necessarily a studio construction <laughs> yeah. focused episode. Nor am I an expert on that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um let's jump right into some questions about records and and bands you've worked with. I, sure. I enjoyed listening to your discography. A lot oh, of cool records you've done. Um one of them was the uh, hardworking Americans. Yeah, Shining Sheep, I think, was the name of the album. Um, uh, the the name of the record is well, man, it's really it's uh, escaping me right now. Um, no, it's uh, 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 Rest in Chaos. Oh, Rest in Chaos. Rest okay, in great. Chaos. Yeah, it was their first uh, original record. So they had made a record before that that was a, a cover record and all like oh, okay, songs dig, that Todd dig. had picked out to yeah. to cover. Um, and Todd Todd Snyder, rock stars, is a um, he is, is a, or was an East Nashville. I, as far resident. as I know, still a still an East Nashville cat. Doing yeah. a lot of cool stuff. I, I've recorded him at my Bonnaroo studio before, and um, he, for me, that that experience was an example of the time when somebody sits in front of your mics and all of a sudden you're like. Man, I'm fucking good at this. Like <laughs> well, the yeah, way he played the acoustic made me sound like I was doing the best miking technique for the acoustic. The Todd way he sang a, on the mic, I was like, man, I really got this dialed in. You know, he's phenomenal. Um, I can't say enough good things about him. Um, and that was just a absolutely amazing record to uh, get to be a part of. Um, so uh, Chicago Farmer is an artist that I've I've produced uh, many records for, and. Uh, his manager is the keyboard player, Chad Staley, for Hard Weekend American. So it's kind of a connection thing. And Chad said, uh, called me and said, we're finishing up a tour and we're looking to uh, work on a record. Uh, do you have some time available? And I was actually supposed to be flying out to Hawaii that week to uh, propose to my wife. And uh, I had and to tell... And then you proposed to her that you should make a record instead? <laughs> yeah, I, I did have to kind of propose that because I was like... 
uh, babe, I, I, I kind of need to take this record. As we all know in, in our industry, if, if something, uh, you know, on the bigger scale comes, comes about, you kind of have to, which quit is every- pretty much in our world. It's like everything that has to do with music <laughs> is, is so important in such big scale. Right. But yeah. And so thank so you, honey. <laughs> Chad had called me and said, uh, yeah, we want to come in and make a record. And of course I looked at the, uh, the musicians on this record and it's unbelievable. You know, it's, uh, uh, Dwayne trucks, who's Derek trucks, brother on drums and Neil Casal, who had played in Ryan Adams, and the Cardinals and, is in Chris Robinson and the Brotherhood and uh, Chad Staley, who's in Great American Taxi, and Todd Snyder. You know, I was just very, wow, cool. And, and uh, Dave Schools from uh, Widespread Panic, who I was a huge fan of growing up. So nice. I was like, man, I got to do, do this record, so I got to stick around. Um, so my wife <laughs> flew to Hawaii, and then I met her later and then proposed to her. That's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, so uh, these guys came in. Um, they had their last show in Chicago at Park West. And I went and met them and hung out in the tour bus for a little bit and talked about the idea of making this record. And uh, they wrote and recorded about 80 or 90 percent of the record uh, in about a week and a half. That's cool, man. Well, you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was listening to it, too, is um, the drums. There was something there's a quality. um, And I feel like I've heard this maybe, you know, even just clicking through on the IV um, sound, uh, how do I say it? It's Ivy Labs Studios. studios. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Not Sound Labs. <laughs> Ivy Studio La- or Lab Studios. Um, but like, y- you seem to have a qu- an ability to really bring out the snares, the underside of a snare drum wow. into the whole drum sound in a cool way. And um, it's cool. like, it, it's not, uh, it's not sort of, competing with other things, but it's really highlighted. And I wondered if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you get some of that sizzly snare sound or just, you know, um, any, any tricks that you've learned about recording drums. Sure. You know, that, that ways that you really enjoy doing. Um, yeah, I didn't mix that record of course, but, uh, I did track, uh, a large majority of the drums for that record and got a huge compliment for when they came down to, uh, finish like one or two songs in Nashville. Uh, the engineer had, or Dave schools had emailed me and said, uh, what mics were you using and what were you doing on the drums? Cause we want to like find that. Nice, man. <laughs> and that was uh, an insane compliment. I was like, Holy cow. <laughs> You're um, like, well, they're all right up here in the studio. Come on back. Guys. Yeah, right? we'll send a bus down for you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, very simple, uh, snare drum wise. I don't think that there was anything, uh, other than a 57 on the bottom of the snare. And, uh, I've been really hip on like the last five years. I'm trying to remember the the model of that microphone, but Telefunken's 57. Uh, oh, okay, cool. Uh, I forget the name of it, but that's usually my top snare. Okay, mic. is that a newer mic or a vi- more of a vintage model? No, no, it's a newer one. It's like kind of their their take on a 57 oh, that cool. they put right. out maybe take like it. eight or nine years ago. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the the we'll number. Find it. <laughs> yeah, of that's that good microphone. enough, for Rockstar. <laughs> Just start googling Telefunken 57. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's typically my top snare mic. Uh, bottom snare mic has always just been a 57. Um, I will uh, go with. Uh, I don't recall on that record if I if I did some condensers or coals on I, I kind of switch back and forth between for overheads uh, whether it be uh, some some usually small diaphragm condensers or uh, a coals forty thirty eights. Let me back up and ask you about that Telefunken, which I think you were saying is on the top mic on the snare. How would you describe the sound? How is it? How do you feel like it is similar or different to the 50, a regular fifty seven underneath? Yeah, I, I just feel like it has a little more bite, a little more top end than a than a fifty seven. A little more of maybe that's the the quality that you're talking about as far as like maybe bringing, so maybe bringing out that crack a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I I, I kind of ab that for a while once we got a pair of them uh, against a fifty seven on the snare. I'd put them both kind of facing the middle. You no, know, top scene. top mic and a snare is uh, an interesting conundrum sometimes because. A lot of times I find myself wanting to boost a lot of high end on it sure. as part of it. But then there's other times where I'm like, I'm like trying to pull back from that. Cause I'm like, you know what, what I really need to get out of this is just the, the, the meat, meat body out the of 200. Of yeah. Snare. And then you're like, okay, screw it. How do I get both? <laughs> right. And yeah. Um, and I will say, uh, I'm very much into commitment. So I know on that record that I didn't, uh, split up the bottom and top snare. I, I went for it on the console and, and blended them. Oh, cool, man. Uh, the way that I, I felt it sounded good. Um, I think at the end of the day, like everything, it was an unbelievable drummer. Yeah. <laughs> like, that usually helps, right? Yeah. Like Dwayne was unbelievable. Um, 
but yeah, so that's uh, my typical setups. I, I like to use E22s on the on the toms, which are those Steve Albini designed yeah. microphones. Josephson mics. Josephson's yep. E22s. Uh, they just blow my mind on toms. I try and put other things on tom mics, and it just doesn't doesn't give me the the meat that those those things do. Those are my favorite tom mics. They're I unbelievable. I mean, I've, I've used a lot. Um, right now, I'm using the mic techs and the Lewitts here in my studio a lot, and I love them. They sound yeah. great. The Josephsons are just ones that I've used before where like uh they they really just sound like hi-fi versions it's, of your toms. It's crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the microphone design is is phenomenal because they just every time I put them on a tom and the toms tuned correctly, like it just it's just meat. It just uh, you, you know, I I think I fought for a long time trying to get toms to to come up and as those microphones came around in our studio, I was like, Oh, wow. <laughs> I believe that, uh, I know that, you know, one of Steve's favorite mics also on Tom's is the AKG 451s. Okay. Sure. Um, or has been, you know, wow. Yeah, okay. I believe so. I think that's what we used, uh, when we were recording with him early on. Yeah. Um, maybe the Josephson, uh, they, maybe they were just arriving at that point. I, I can't remember the timing. Sure. But, uh, but I'm wondering too, if the, uh, justice and model, like if there's like a crossover. Uh, yeah. Like a similarity to those. Similar. Yeah. I mean, the, the 451 to me is surprisingly has enormous amounts of low end. Yeah. Like I use that microphone on acoustic guitar a lot and it's just, you wouldn't think that little, little guy would put out that much beef, but it does. Uh, that much beef. Well, <laughs> you're from Chicago after all. <laughs> we, we got a lot of beef. <laughs> all right. So, um. Let's jump forward to, um, well, before we do, actually, let me say, uh, what about like ambient mics, room mics? What's your thoughts on that kind of stuff? To, sure. To make the, like, if you just listen to closed mics on a drums, they can all sound really cool by themselves, but you could also find yourself down the road going like, why are my drums not making sense against the rest of this music? Sure. Uh, for rooms, I'm a huge ribbon fan. Like, I like to use a lot of ribbon mics. Uh Definitely, uh, I think a huge part of our sound is the R88. Um, I love that's the stereo AEA ribbon mic. Uh, that's usually, I usually have that thing about 20 feet, uh, 20 to 30 feet, depending away from the, the kick drum. And I like to set it kind of facing at the kick drum, maybe half of the mic uh, at the level of the kick drum and the other half kind of picking up the rest of the kit. Um, so that's so the mic. So in other words, the mic. The, if you hit the center of the mic, that would be the top rim of the kick drum. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Right, cool. Um, that and then uh, see, we don't need to be watching this on YouTube. We can visualize <laughs> it all. Visualize right here. it. Um, and then another huge uh, uh, mic that I love that I picked up from one of my mentors is I would do a U87 basically in the middle of the kick drum uh, in Omni and uh, kind of facing the snare a little bit, but like literally right over top of the kick drum. And then I would squash the shit out of it with like an SSL compressor. Oh, uh, so middle of the kick drum above it. Above it, yeah. So it's, if looking, if it, if it w could look, it's an Omni, but if it could look, it would be looking over at the side of the snare drum as well? Kind of, yeah, yeah. Like if facing towards, because trying to eliminate some of the symbols a little bit, but it's right. an Omni, so it's still picking up a lot of stuff. Right, but, right. Um, yeah, so that was a huge mic for me. I think I just started before that Hard Working America's record. Like, that was kind of a new thing. And then literally just squashing the piss out of it on uh, on the channel strip on the SSL console. And, and then you uh, just blend that in with the other mics. Yeah. Do you, uh, is that one that all, also it's very important to sort of check the phase polarity against the other mics? Uh, it depends. Uh, it kind of, sometimes it depends what you're going for in that sound. Um, with room mics, I'm not like super specific about checking phase on them because I, I think sometimes the character of a room mic is, is that it's not perfectly in phase. Nice. Um, so that's kind of a huge thing for me. I, I think it's more for me, it's like when I, I'll just put it up and I'm not really checking phase on that microphone. If I'm mixing that particular project, then I will, I might play around with the phase a little bit on it, but with those kind of like fun or different kind of blown up mics, uh, uh, I would just put it up and it is what it is and you blend it in, it still sounds cool. <laughs> What's a good example of a setting on a compressor that kind of gives it that blown up quality that I say, mean, say the close mic, the Omni that's right there. Sure. I mean like just like a really fast uh, attack and like a slower release and then just basically diming the threshold as, as far as you can so that it's just. So the squashed. needle's just kind of buried the yeah, whole time. Yeah, totally. Okay. All right. Cause I think I feel like when you add that underneath the open drums that are not compressed as hard, it's uh it just adds this like extra space. Uh, so a way to think about it is when the dr when you the drummer hits one of the drums, n none of that attack or body sneaks through that sound 
And sure. Like, that, there'd be no punch to it, right? Exactly, yeah. It's kind of like, it's just open kind of all the time. I don't know how to explain that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but when after the hit, all that sustain is constantly yeah. at full volume. Sure. Okay, cool. Yeah. So then when you blend that in against the other mics, it's just like you get the punch of the close mics, but but a mic like that kind just of a adds wash this to like some extent, yeah. Like ev- there's n- like a no detail is missing or lost from the sound of this drum kit. Like sure, that's yeah. That's if a good the drummer squeaks yeah. his left little toe, you're gonna hear it through that mic. <laughs> Absolutely, as well, right? yeah, okay. totally. All right, dig it. And I, and I remember also on that uh, particular drum sound too, uh, room mic that I was talking about the the R88 uh, was. Always going through the TG1, that Chandler compressor. Um, uh, That's such a great compressor. It's unbelievable. I need to get one of those. It's again. so cool. We were out one for a little bit, and we just uh, uh, my business partner just picked up another one, and it's just. I, I can't say enough things about that compressor, like that thing. And just, that's for the stereo room for mic? For the stereo room Is TG1 stereo or it's mono? It's stereo, okay, yeah. Okay, right. yeah. And it's very also kind of a slower compressor. It's after the old Abbey Road stuff, so it's not a super quick compressor. So also kind of like that other idea we're talking about is kind of just keeping the weight of that whole kit kind of going the whole time. Yeah, I remember the TG1 as being one that could go real extreme sounding though too, couldn't it? it you can blow it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, totally. It. Yeah, because it has um, a limiter and a, and a compressor on and it. And then how about the um, Distressor? Is that one that you like to use as well? I do. Almost every session I do is probably a kick and snare around the Distressor. Uh, right on. Yeah, just on Opto basically, uh, which is, uh, I think it's attack at 10 and release at 1. And... Uh, you know, like two to three dB a gain reduction on that guy. But, and that's when I'm also like to make the decision to, you know, I blend my kick and snare from the console and then run them. So one distressor through kick, one distressor through snare. And, nice. Uh, yeah. And it just kind of adds that little extra, extra evenness to shout to out to room. Dave Durr of Empirical Labs. <laughs> I um, Dave, love their stuff. I still owe you a video from Winter Nam. So depending on the timing of this podcast, <laughs> I will have either published it or or is still waiting on it. But thank you as well, because Dave rocks. Your, yeah, can use your compressors. It's, all it's the time. really fun when you get to meet the people that are building the things that you use, and sure. and you realize how cool they are. And I have to get to meet. Uh, I got to go to Chandler. My home state is Iowa, and Chandler's out of Iowa. Uh, oh, I've nice. been meaning to. It's like literally on my drive home from Chicago to my parents' house. So I, I've, that's that's on my bucket list to like swing in there and, and say hello and Very say, cool. and say Very thank cool. you. <laughs> All right. So um, let's jump forward to, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Ida Hawk. Oh, Ida Hawk. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So um, got one, one of those uh, links you sent me had these great muted stereo electric guitars. And I believe you mixed this one. I did. I didn't track it. Uh, it was tracked in New York, but I did mix it. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I wanted to know if you wanted to share any stories about getting that kind of sound or mixing that muted guitar sound where it's like, you know, driving the verse. And this one was just driving the whole damn song. Sure. Um, and, um, and what kind of things do you really like to do when you're mixing guitars? Um, oh, man, uh, that's a tough question. Uh, that was one of these situations where you get a piece of uh, music that was just recorded phenomenally. Like I was just blown away and I was lucky enough. I, I've done a lot of uh, a lot of stuff with with Ida and uh she was like, oh, I just tracked this out in New York. Uh, and the musician on that, who kind of produced that song for her, was uh, uh, played everything on it. He played drums, bass, guitars, synths, keys, whatever. Very cool. Yeah, whatever was on it. Um, and I, to be honest, I don't really recall what I did on those guitars. Um, I feel like he had them, uh, they were super tight already. And uh, I probably did some real simple compression on them to kind of like... He, he really just knocked it out of the park. Um, I wish I could. Well, it's all right. What, what if you if I handed you some guitars on a on a song similar to that today? What would be some first things you might try? Clean or dirty? <laughs> um, dirty, but the muted quality means we're holding back. Okay. We haven't opened up to the chorus. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm just a, a real simplistic kind of guy when it comes to that sort of stuff. Like I'm probably just gonna I'm gonna use a really fast compressor that will uh, just kind of just tap on those guitars and let them kind of breathe and live in the mix. Uh, uh, but yeah, I can't, uh, that's, I can't really think of too many like other ideas of what I would do. I'm, I'm a big subtractive EQ person. So like, okay, let's I, talk about that. What, yeah. What, what when I, thoughts? when I get guitars, um, I, almost when I'm mixing anything, like I, I start just by doing the peak, pull it up and, and getting rid of those frequencies that suck. Uh, that's interesting. Cause you know, Johnny Truesdale, when he was on the show, he also shared talking about like, how guitars seem to always have this frequency. God, what was the range? It was like 
three K or something like that. I don't know what it was, but sure, I'm he was just like, a sweeper, just, so I don't, yeah, just yeah. <laughs> not there's like he was presenting it as if there's always something that might be worth just notching out and removing from a guitar. Totally. Yeah. I'm not a big additive person in EQ, especially in guitars. I feel like that the, if once you get rid of the the stuff that if you're blowing up and sounds terrible, like by peaking it and, and, and pushing the gain all the way up on that, that certain tight band of frequency, then, uh, then you get rid of that and it just kind of fits. <laughs> okay, cool. How many of those would be reasonable to be pulling out? I mean, might you do it like four times, four it, little notch filters on one of those guitars? It possibly? could be eight, depending really? on. I mean, if it's, uh, cool. you know, it, it all depends on the quality of the recording, too. If it's something someone else recorded and it was in their bedroom with a, a Marshall stack that is on 11 and you're trying you're to. You're looking for the bedroom frequency. <laughs> you're trying to manage that uh, that guitar and put it in, in, in a mix with other instruments. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say typically three to four, but uh, if. Depending on the uh, the recording itself, it could be seven or eight. Like, okay, but that, and, I think that's really helpful because that's the kind of stuff that makes us pull our hair out when we're doing that the first time. And then we look at it and we're like, oh, shit, that looks too complicated. Am I screwing this all up, you know? Sure, yeah. And I mean, it's just, for me, it's just blowing it up. And once, when it sounds so terrible on your speakers, take it down three or four dB. <laughs> and do you, do you then have, like, have a process where you'll like – bypass what you just did and all that and kind of compare it against the original again and, and of course be like, oh, yeah, yeah yeah like that like, original sucks and this doesn't suck so much sure like pop it in the mix and then yeah. and then see the difference between yeah and i mean nine times out of ten if you get rid of those those terrible frequencies it's gonna sit better get rid of the terrible tones all right cool um another thing i noticed about ida was the drums sounding really cool. So the, it was interesting how the snare, and I think it had like tambourine on top, okay. was really kind of sitting out front of the lead vocal, which sure. was sitting back. But they both sounded super cool and like they were both fully there as needed. Um, what tricks might you use to get that kind of uh, effect? Um, there was something else I wanted to say, and I'll throw this in too. It also seemed like the hi hat was intentionally mixed lower than the guitars. Um, and I wondered if you ever find it difficult to choose who's getting, like that who gets the yeah. subdivisions on this production. You know? <laughs> sure. Yeah, where that one had kind of like a, a, the tight kind of rhythmic guitar on. on yeah, and well, note. and I was mentally trying to picture, okay, well, what would this sound like if the hi-hat was as loud as those guitars? Would that be fucking me up right now or would that be a good thing? I mean, sure. Just, just maybe you can talk about any of those issues. Yeah, um, I definitely remember uh, the snare drum was quite, quite important in that tune because it was like, uh, it was like longer, slow. Um, it was really quick too. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and I do remember I mixed that uh, that particular song analog um, through the API, and where I really love to do the, uh, you know, the parallel compression, which for for snare always just makes it makes it so much beefier and and just gives it that weight as you start to slowly pull up those those parallel compressed uh, yeah. uh compressors underneath the, your original drum kit um but yeah uh mix that one analog and uh i i definitely remember i mean that was probably a similar thing in my mix that i do in tracking um where these files came from somebody else as well so um i imagine i had a, a distressor on a kick and snare and then i'm running uh that through uh, my kick and snare are paralleling through the old school dynamite compressor. I don't know if you know that one. Oh, yeah. Well, I've got the gain brains right down uh, here. The gain brains, the yeah, awesome yeah. Research. <laughs> so research. Pre-dynamite. Uh, and yeah, it was a two-channel two channel compressor that was usually my kick and snare. Comes in the yellow box. Yep, yep. So, so like pulling up, get my normal drum kit, then I'm extra compressing the kick and snare through that compressor, and then usually doing two more stereo compressors uh, on the console next to those two, uh, usually was either a TG1 and uh, maybe the the TSL. Uh, I'm, I'm terrible with like names. Oh, that's right. right. <laughs> Let's say that one more time because I even spaced out for a second. I want to make sure I got it. So we've got, um, let's just think about the snare for a sec. So we've got the snare, uh, the mic, the track yeah. for the top of the snare. Um, that one's getting paralleled so that you can have a parallel compression. Of just but is, snare. Yeah. But is the mic itself also getting a little compressor it on is, it that, as well? It is. The distressor's on the insert of the console. Okay, great. And then I'm also adding... Uh, so I, I would always just basically add three stereo 
a uh, section or three stereo channels of parallel compression on the console. So I'm I'm getting just my kick and snare on two channels of, of compression through the dynamite and then a stereo compression, uh, which would be like the TG1 or a TSL, very, very simple uh, compressors and uh, and then add those those up. So we, we're it's Daisy the dog make, <laughs> she's getting crazy out there. Tearing the studio part outside. <laughs> so basically you have your normal drum sound coming out eight, nine, ten faders on the console, and then you're bussing these. Uh, and so like kick and snare would be bust. I would usually do kick snare toms through the second stereo compressor, and then kick snare toms overheads and rooms through the third compressor and bring those up. Okay, okay cool. Does, if that makes sense. I'm sorry if that's getting too No, no, I think it's good. And, and I feel like one of the first lessons I had to learn was that, um, you know, I was worried about doing too much treatment to sound. And then it turned out that I wasn't doing nearly enough. You know, it's like, <laughs> I remember the first time a band pushed me towards triple compressing a vocal as we were tracking it. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, triple compression? Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you nuts? Until we did it. And it was like, you know, one of the ones we did was the, uh, I mean, we would do like Distressor 1176 Distressor or totally. Distressor LA-2A yeah. um, TG-1, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. And like, once you start doing this stuff, you're like, holy shit, that sounds It's amazing. amazing and it, it starts you know? like, you just have to kind of control each one a little bit and not yeah. get too crazy with each one, but like stacking them on top of each other. I'm the same way with vocals. Like I'm I'm a distressor through like an 1176, like all the time. Like yeah. I get the fast stuff with the 1176 and then, or excuse me, with the distressor and then kind of the the slower meat with the with the 1176. Yeah. Do you know about the triple button trick on, uh, uh, on push the them all distressor? In. Yeah. No, no, on the distressor. Uh, no. I don't yeah, you, you do the, um, the side chain one. You do that so that all three lights are on, so it thinks it's getting a side chain, but you don't have a side chain going wow. in. Wow. And then we would do like an open attack on that, maybe a four to one or a six to one and- That and is awesome. No, that. I've never- it, just, it did had this like open it up, make it a little louder thing. And yeah. I don't know. We stumped. That's that came right, from I got, working. I get to leave trying out something. New yeah, yeah. That, that came from working with Lillian and the Living Things, and and he had the advantage of, you know, kind of not giving a shit about any of the tech stuff. So he would just sit there and push buttons and try shit out until he <laughs> found something. <laughs> yeah. And then I'd learn stuff from him. So sure, you know, there's a lot of um, things like that. I think that happen when you work with people enough times. Totally. And you get that good combination. Yeah, of, and I like that idea. Like he was hitting buttons, and you're like, wow, yeah, because he just have the headphones on, and he'd have the mic, and he'd do it until it sounded good in his headphones. Yeah, know? cool. And that, I didn't know that. And that thing. is a thing that is hard to do sometimes when we're just taking the engineer producer role. Is like you know all the times where you it's so important to get into a pair of headphones and listen through the mic, and when you start doing that, you realize, wow, this setting all these settings in the studio. It's no harder than just trying to like turn the knobs on your distortion pedal and your guitar until you're like, ooh, I like that. Sure. You and that's, that's the sound I like. But when you're when you're not playing the instrument and you're just in there turning knobs and stuff, it can be such a mind fuck sometimes. It know? can be. Absolutely. And sometimes it can go really good by doing something weird or it can go really bad by doing something yeah. weird. And yeah, I mean, making it sound uh, really great to the artist is is... The most important kind of thing. important, yeah. especially if they're writing the check. <laughs> exactly, which they nowadays they are. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, um, another cool instrument that you had in your productions was some great horns. I think that was on the Ida stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to talk about how you like to approach horns when you're adding them to a record. What, what sure. thoughts go through your head? Uh, that one was kind of blew me away too, and made me change my uh, my outlook on horns a little bit uh, as I've been. Uh, a ribbon guy forever on horns. Like I'll do maybe a, a large diaphragm condenser as a room to get that kind of like like high end kind of squawk. But uh, I've always preferred ribbon mics, like an M160 on a saxophone, or a, a Bayer Dynamic, or a, a or like an AEA R. Uh, what is that one? The R94. Uh, uh, always been very much into to ribbon mics. And then when this this cat Miles sent me those tracks from New York, like. They were like U forty sevens on the on the uh, the horns, and they really just popped out to me. And so, what was the effect? I feel like when I have re been recording with my U sixty seven, you might get more mid range that way. Sure, you know? yeah, and they they were just bright and popping, and it served the song really well because the song was rather open. There wasn't a huge dense production going right, on. Right, there was space. Yeah, but, but then was... I could tell from your mix, you really had to. Be selective about like who's up front, who's in the back. Sure, yeah, and we kind of messed around with the horns a lot. As far I, I can't remember if it was a four piece horn section or if it was, how many horns were on that, but uh, um, 
Yeah, I basically like similar. I like to do like kind of a bus compression thing to those guys as well, uh, to where I real, real simple on the compression of each instrument and EQ simple and then bust them to a stereo set of tracks and kind of give those guys some more flavor. And that's might be where I might add a little bit of top end uh, after I kind of took away some of the bad frequencies from the individual horns. But once that's gone, to be able to add that back in uh, on the stereo bus compression. Would horns also get a parallel compression? Yes, exactly what I'm okay. talking about. All yeah, right. so they have their regular uh, send on the console stereo and then bussing them to another another stereo compressor. Where Hot it's kinda... diggity, man. <laughs> um, if, so, if a horn section, let's say you were doing... I don't know, a, a 70s singer-songwriter kind of vibe, mm -hmm. um, sort of pop, pop, medium, light rock or whatever, and they brought in horns uh, at IV Lab Studios. What would be some of your first moves for, you know, a three-piece horn section? What would be some things that you might try? I, I, I still uh, dig the ribbons, like as far as the close mics, so that's something I'm going to do. Uh, and then I'll probably put up two different sets of stereo room mics in, in the room, whether it be a... Uh, a pair of uh, large diaphragm condensers, or or uh, and and oftentimes too, maybe even a stereo bar with like some small diaphragms up close to kind of get uh, the the brightness of the horns up close, but then still be able to have that large space. Uh, Three musicians just walked into your studio. Are you like, oh, we got to isolate you guys and have you in separate rooms for horns? No way. Okay, so yeah. talk talk about that. Where where what's the positioning like? What's um, the I'll put them in the middle of the room. Like I'll, I'll have them in the middle of the room where. Once again, working in this room for a long time, I kind of know where where it's going to sound good and where it's going to be open, um, and give them plenty of space to have a room like farther back that that I can pick up uh, a good amount of the natural reverb in the room. Um, but yeah, I typically if it's a string quartet or a, a horn section on an overdub situation, uh, I wouldn't like to unless it's the same player, obviously like repeating himself, which I feel gets very stale. Um, if it's a section, then. Yeah, I want them to play together because it just has a, such a different vibe. And, and and the room collects a lot of information as far as the natural uh, reverberation that's going to happen in there. Our room's pretty large and pretty wood, so there's a lot of there's a lot of room in there that yeah. is great. Um, uh, horn combo might be, I don't know, trumpet, saxophone, trombone, or what? what pretty what sort typical. Of combo? That's okay. pretty, yeah. And so um, talk about the mic. Mike, or let's just talk about the mic placement for those three horns. Where where would you start? Sure, I'm I'm pretty simple. I'm kind of a bell guy for like say a trombone. I'm gonna put like a a, a ribbon mic. I'm I kind of always do like the five finger kind of thing. Uh, where what's, what's the five finger? thing? Well, if you take your hand and spread it apart. Um, I'm trying to I'm visually. Are you trying to insult late. me? Is that like an yeah? It's kind of like yeah. Put it something? up to your nose, but <laughs> uh, uh, basically. That gives enough distance if you're spreading your fingers apart and from your thumb to your pinky, it kind of gives enough distance for any of the the punchy or pushy, you know, pop notes that are going to pop out to dissipate before it hits the. Dude, I have to say, mic. man, you're holding your five fingers up, kind of like a like a um, turkey. Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. Crown, but I'm really surprised, being somebody who spent so much time in. Uh, um, my, um, Hawaii that you aren't doing a hang loose, a okay. hang 10. Oh, that's, that, that can work too. Finger, right? Oh, that's totally perfect. You're right. <laughs> All right. So, so, um, putting it in front of the bell means like if it's a trumpet, the bell is the big, you know, the horn part that's sticking out there yeah. at the end. And so the mic's going in front of that. Yeah. Um, kind of dead center or maybe up a little or down, or does I, any of that matter? I'm so really not super technical about that stuff. I like kind of get the, the musician, uh, comfortable where they're going to stand and show me where their horn is. And, those musicians are gonna move, right? They're gonna inches. move physically, yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. physically a, a little bit. So I, I don't get too, too. What crazy. about the saxophone? Sometimes I find that is not always so obvious because there's a horn, but there's also all this, this neck going up, and and I feel like overtones come out of the upper the side part and, of the the horn. Yeah, um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll still pretty much be a bell guy, but uh, I, I will listen. Sometimes if you do the bell like on top too, you might get a little too much of the clickety clack of, right, the, of right. the, uh, the musician. I did a, a coronet part with a, a player in here and the producer later freaked out because he could hear the clacks of the, sure. I was like, you know, yeah. I was like, what am I supposed to do? So yeah, I, we had I to mean, like load it into RX and manually <laughs> remove oh, each God, valve. That terrible. <laughs> well, it's one of those moments where it's like a combination of yes, it's terrible. And yes, I was excited about my ability to be able to, to do, do that. Yeah. yeah. Technology. Well, 
Well, so awesome. Let's take a break and we'll come back in a moment for the jam session. I got some more questions about records. All right. Rockstar, as a reminder, you can find links to all the stuff we're talking about here with Chris in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, just click through. And uh, I will include um, in the uh, on the website too at rsrockstars. Excuse me, rsrockstars.com. Just search Chris, and then in there I've got a YouTube playlist too. Sweet. So if you want to go check out these records, you can just go click through and listen. We'll see you in a moment for the jam session. Cheers. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. You're listening to Recording Studio Rock Stars, and my guest today is Chris Harden, who's joining us from Chicago. Psyched to have him here at the Toy Box Studio. Chris, are you ready to jam? I am ready to jam. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, you you said you were actually down in Nashville because. Above and beyond your your um, expertise at making records, you were also well versed in the art of beer. Well, newly versed in the in the art of beer, I, I was a huge fan of beer, and a, a musician that I worked with uh, was a uh, brewmaster at a brewery in town. And as we started talking, uh, uh, he was he thought that I had some knowledge of beer, and his assistant got fired. And he was sent me a text one day, jokingly like, uh, "Would you be interested in uh, an assistant position?" And I'd Ha ha ha! Like, and I was like, actually, I really am. Um, I just feel like it's another one of those old world artesian crafts, like uh, making records, that uh, has an enormous amount of similarities uh, in large production brewing. We have a ten barrel brew house, so it's uh, you're basically signal flowing everything as you're brewing beer. You're signal flowing where the beer is going to go from the mash tun to the uh, mash tun to the uh, to the kettle to the to the louder, and you're opening valves and, and closing them and turning on pumps, uh, very similar nice. to, to plugging in a microphone and uh, routing it through your patch bay to a compressor or to a, a mic pre to a compressor uh, into your, your your DAW or your tape machine. So I'm, I'm sort of visualizing here, um, you know, a future idea where it's like brewery slash studio or it's a studio that has a super brewery theme to it. I, I think that's great. <laughs> or, or maybe like, you know, when it's time for you to create your own plugins, it can be like this kind of, I don't know. I don't know why I, why I have to throw steampunk into it, but maybe <laughs> it's steampunk meets brewery and those are like all the plugin settings. Sure. I'm totally down with that. Uh, all right. So which part of making beer is the compressor? Ooh, that's a... That's a tough question. Which part of making beer is the compressor? I guess in wine, it would be stomping the grapes. Or, or sure. That stage, yeah. I mean, I guess it would be uh, uh, when you mash into the uh, uh, <laughs> to the mash tun because you're adding the the grain into the water and uh, producing sugars uh, that are getting compressed in. Like you're trying to maximize sugar content at that point, so that when you go to add yeast, uh, it's gonna the, the yeast is going to eat all those sugars and make alcohol and carbon dioxide. Which and so is is dry hopping afterwards, is that kind of like parallel compression? That sounds perfect to it's me. It's like, it's sort of like throwing, because you're literally throwing in like dry hops at that point. Dry hops. Past yeah, the cooking beef, point. To beef it up a little bit. Exactly. It's, it's <laughs> like when you, you know, you, send, you pass through the uh, unprocessed drum signals to blend with the super processed drum signals. Yeah. So I'm down here for uh, CBC, which is the craft beer conference. Uh, so I'll be here for four or five days uh, enjoying tons of good beer and good deal, running man. around Nashville. So you were saying that uh, as you popped open this beer on, on the microphone. <laughs> oh, yeah. This, oh, do you want to give a shout out to that I, particular I got to give a shout too? out to the, the Hip Trip guys. Uh, we we I think that's the way that their record started out as they drank uh, probably 
20, 30 packs of Rolling Rock uh, as we made that record. <laughs> wow. That's a lot of Rolling Rock. <laughs> yeah. Old the Troby never looked so double, triple, quadruple. There, There is a song called Old the Trobe on that record, I believe. Uh, but it has the lyrics from from the written uh, uh, montage on the the. Rolling Rock can. so yeah. And so you guys started that record out with the, the beer can opening? I'm pretty sure. If it's not the start of the record, it's one of the tunes, uh, which I think is called, uh, uh, it's not called Old Detrobe, but it has a verse in there that is Old Detrobe. And it's a band called Hip Trip. Yeah. Um, but there was a lot of, uh, almost every take we did, someone was like cracking a beer on the microphone before we started. That's the fun to do. <laughs> um, so that reminds me of a record I did with the Fluid Ounces. Was less, sort of like perfect name exactly, for that. <laughs> yeah. And it was my first uh, sort of first engineering gig out of college, and and I was over at Alex the Great, and we're in there, and, and the bass player Ben, shout out to you, um, he shows up, and we had a bottle of some sort of whiskey or something with the cork. Thing on top, you know, yeah. and so we thought it was so cool. We we're like, "Dude, you gotta go out and open it on the mic." And he's like, "Squeak, boom," you know, and, <laughs> and did that. And we we're like, "Yes, that's so awesome!" And then we came in, we were going to show it to him, and of course, it was moments after that that we discovered that that's exactly how Dinosaur Junior, I think, opened up one of their albums. Really, completely the same sound. Yeah, I think it was Dinosaur Junior. Yeah, so then it was just like, "Oh, I guess we can't do that." Sorry. <laughs> That's Which is awesome. a shame, because these days I'm like, of course you can do it. We can all do it. Yeah, who who needs to say that if it's been done before, it can't be done. I mean, I mean there'd good, be no more music. Uh, yeah, good good musicians borrow, great musicians steal. All right, so <laughs> another band that you worked with that sounds great, Chicago Farmer. That's one that you've really produced and, and done everything for, right? Yeah. Um, Back and Forth, Illinois, was that one of the records? That was, yeah. Um, um, it's got some great Roots Americana sounds on it, and I wanted to know if you wanted to share any stories about that, or particularly about re- recording acoustic guitar as well. Sure. Um, well, what blows me away about Cody Decoff uh, goes by the moniker of Chicago Farmer. Um, every record that I've done with him, he tracks the guitar and vocal live. Uh, so it's usually... Uh, the basic tracking will be like drums, bass, uh, acoustic guitar, vocal, maybe an electric guitar, depending on what tune. Uh, but he's always blown me away uh, as far as uh, tracking that live together. He's kind of one of those guys that we don't ever really do click tracks with him because he has his own rhythm. And Yeah, totally. And the minute you put a click track on him, it, it sounds stale. And So the, what he plays and sings when the drums are happening, that's the vocal. That's the take. And sometimes, okay, that's you know, great. Yeah, sometimes we'll do, you know, five or six takes of a song. Sometimes we'll go back and recut a song because he wasn't really necessarily happy with the vocal performance, like uh, where I think it's great. I mean, he's just, he blows me away as a folk artist uh, coming out today. Um, and so, yeah, almost, no, every everything that we cut with him is guitar and vocal cut, cut live. Yeah. Well, that's great. So let's dig right into that. So that's sure. one of the things that I think we all can really appreciate when, the, when there's those times where we really want to do that. But there's certainly a lot of challenges around like, like how do you get a great vocal sound? Or, yeah. or how many times they've had a conversation where they're like, we're doing a scratch vocal and it's like, and somebody's like, well, I mean, it'd be cool if we could get a, you know, a keeper sound just in case we like it and want to keep it. Sure. And I'm always like, there's a part of me that go, that sinks a little bit. And it's like, oh, how am I going to do that? You know, so um, talk to us about the things that are that seem like obstacles, but maybe aren't, or talk to us about, you know, how do you configure and set up the whole band so that you can keep the vocals so that you can get the right acoustic sound with that? Sure. Yeah. He's usually isolated, um, obviously in a booth for the acoustic guitar and vocal. Um, and I'm typically like a large diaphragm, like, uh, 47 or 67 on his vocal. And then I'll, kind of use uh, a couple different mics. I've I've been privy to use a, a 451 and then also a large diaphragm on his acoustic as well, but then also like a 451 and maybe an E22 as well. But it's kind of just, uh, you go in and check phase on, uh, so on, the mics that are on the guitar are all very much phase aligned because I'll set the, the capsules up right next to each other so that they're- Right, so they're physically, physically the same distance from the guitar. Exactly. Now, why would you use so many mics? They were um, right next to each other. <laughs> uh, I started out with just one on him. And as I added these microphones, I got more depth and more body out of his acoustic guitar. Uh, his acoustic guitar that he uses all the time, that's been on every record, is is a little thinner. Um, and he plays a little lighter string. So uh, uh, I'll typically, and once again, I'll commit to those microphones as I'm tracking. I'll bust them together. But the big thing is kind of setting it up and then seeing how the phase correlation is to the vocal mic and the guitar mics. And... 
if you kind of just eyeball it and hope that it, it's working, but if you go in and listen in the control room and you're hitting the phase uh, switches on the the acoustic versus the vocal mic, um, sometimes it'll it's kind of not. You won't really know a difference. Like uh, neither one's great. Yeah, neither one's great. So then I'll just kind of go out and move the microphones around on him until until it feels good. Um, Interesting. Uh, um, so you didn't say I'll just move the tracks in Pro Tools to get it to sound right. I I try not to do that. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Take it. Um, you know, when you're talking about the mics, you talked about I think a large diaphragm on the guitar. Yeah. But then also the Josephson, which is kind of a medium diaphragm, right? Sure. And then also. Um, like a 451, a 451 which yeah. is a small diaphragm. So if I was to take all three of those mics and stick them in a wood cabinet and take the covers off, it would kind of look like three drivers on a speaker, wouldn't it? <laughs> sure. It's like the reverse of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. And then, yeah, then it's just kind of like understanding where the capsules are actually on those microphones, because obviously the cover of the capsule might be, you know, like right. uh, a little different. So um, I think that's just over time, you kind of realize where those capsules are actually sitting um, and kind of time aligning those with each microphone as you as you put those together. Okay, cool. And then distance of those mics to the guitar versus distance of the vocal mic to his mouth. I, I start I'm with assuming the, he's singing with his mouth. It, sometimes. Uh, right. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I usually start with kind of a vis visual idea of what that is to where I can see how far the microphone is from his mouth where he'll be sitting and then how far his acoustic guitar is from uh, from those three microphones. And uh, yeah, usually just try and visualize first and then go in and listen and see how that correlates from from the vis visual representation that I'm seeing. Like, Do you think that there's any um, rule, kind of like the one to three to one um, ratio going on there at all? I, which I, my understanding is that if you're putting two mics out on a couple of things, if the distance is one to each of those things, it should be three to the other thing. Sure. Um, I don't think I've ever taken that into perspective. All right, I've been screw doing... it. Forget I even asked that <laughs> no, one. No, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm once again not super technical. Like, I'm never pulling out tape and measuring things between Or things. you'd be like, hey, listen, man, I'm sorry. Uh, we just got to sling your guitar lower. There's just no <laughs> yeah, way around right. it. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I'm never, like, really that guy that gets out of tape measure. I kind of just, like, set it up and go in and listen, and, it, and if it... If it feels good, I move on. If it doesn't, then I adjust and and, and accordingly and by distance wise. Wait, did you say accordionly? Uh, <laughs> um, I should have. Uh, do you record accordions sometimes? I've recorded some accordions. Yeah. Let's talk about that. What? How do you record an accordion? <laughs> Somebody walks in with an accordion and you've never recorded one before. What are you supposed to do? Um, for me, I think ninety percent of the time that I've recorded an accordion, it's been a uh, uh, more of an ambient type situation never like i mean i've done close mics on accordion but usually i'm like two or three foot away from the the accordion and picking up a little bit of that room uh i guess on the records i've done it's usually more of an ambient thing and, and you want kind of some space with that instrument so yeah it'll be just like uh, once again i'm never super technical it'll be like a large diaphragm uh like two feet from the accordion and so, so the unasked question is there's two sides to an accordion sometimes. There's the keyboard side and there's the bass note side. Sure. And I guess your answer is like, if you move the mic back enough, you're getting both. both. So it doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm I, once again, I, I never get too technical. I like go walk around the accordion and, and listen and see where uh, where it sounds cool. <laughs> nice. And does accordion ever sound cool? No, I'm just kidding. I, 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 I think, think accordion can. rocks. Yeah, I, I love it, it. I love it. <laughs> I just like uh, propagating the accordion jokes. <laughs> uh, what's the accordion joke? The one about the accordion player who like finishes his gig and and he's, it's late and he's really hungry and he pulls over to, you know, the Waffle House or somewhere like that, to the diner to go, to go get some late night food. And he... Um, He's sitting down, he's eating, and all of a sudden he freaks out and he's like, oh my God, I forgot to lock the car. <laughs> and so he like gets up and he jumps out and um, I can't even remember the the way the joke goes. He, <laughs> he, he like jumps out. Oh yeah, he jumps out and he runs out to his, his car where the hatchback was shut but not locked. Yeah. And, um, and he gets out there and sure enough, somebody has broken into his car and left a second accordion in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's great. I hope I redeemed my punchline with the, uh, with the, the poor delivery. All right. So um, one of the things about working with uh, Chicago Farmer is that you are acting the role of engineer and producer sure. and mixer. Um, maybe 
talk to us a little bit about balancing engineering and producing. What does that even mean? Is it important to not blur the lines between the two? Like, what advice do you have for people? What is what were some of the struggles when you're doing that? Yeah, um, I, I guess with with advice? Cody, Chicago farmer, uh, we've worked together for so long. Um, man, we've done like six or seven records over a span of 10, 12 years. And uh, you, you basically build that trust. And I, I feel like nowadays it's very uh, – the line is blurred between producer and engineer as – you know, different from from the days of of record labels and when it was like, you're the engineer, you will have no artistic creativity in this record, you're just going to sit behind and make things sound good, and the, the producer will add his artistic uh, 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 elements to, to this song or to right. this record. And when the singer's singing, don't hum a harmony in the background in the control. Note. Oh, it's terrible. I think I do it all the time. <laughs> but I also end up singing those harmonies on all those records. There you go. He's working <laughs> up your, next, your part. Um. But yeah, I think it, I think it's kind of one in the same uh, with Cody. It's just like we have such a a, a great trust uh, working together and a great more than anything a great friendship. Like I mean, we go hang out and have have some beers sometimes. You know, do you like, feel like there are elements of what you're doing when you're making a record together that uh, that you would describe as the production part? And how how might you describe this? Yeah, I mean, with him, it, like production gets pretty simple when you're making a folk record. Like especially when it's basically the arrangement has been put together live and and you're recording it. Um, I think that really on on those types of records, the production comes in on the side of uh, of of overdubs. Like uh, if we're gonna add a, a a violin to this part or add some horns or or a, a female background singer. Um, and Cody kind of trusts me on those parts. Like he he comes in with the arrangement and the song and. Uh, mostly it's not really rehearsed with the band before it comes in the studio. We just, we put it down. We, and we will play it through a few times with the band and see what works. And, and sometimes the production on that end will get to be like, uh, okay, well let's figure out what this drum part's doing in, in this particular section, the verse, like, is it too busy? Do we need to add a simpler beat or do we need to, uh, make it crazier? Um, so yeah, with him, it's just such a, a, a great relationship that him and I have to, to work together and, uh, and he, he's very much a part of it too. Um, as far as the production, I feel like, cause he helps arrange the song. I mean, he's arranging the song as it's coming into the studio. Uh, we're not really doing pre-production on his stuff. He, he writes it as a, a folk artist on acoustic guitar and, and, uh, we don't really demo things. Uh, he's been great and has worked with so many amazing musicians. Uh, usually our good buddy, Darren Garvey is on drums who just, gets it uh, like every time we bring Darren in on Cody songs he just has it and we don't really have to change anything it's like nice. it's just kind of the melding of of those people like the con conglomeration of all those people working together have you ever been in situations where you felt like you wanted to be doing more production or have more opportunity in production but maybe felt a little bit stuck on the engineering angle of things absolutely I mean yeah I've, I've worked with many producers where I'm just the role of the engineer and uh and and then you just you you bite your tongue. It's not your place to go in and say what the production should be of that song because there's a producer there that is right. uh, in that role. Yeah. And then um, so if you were in those uh, stages of your career, maybe we were like, I really want to be doing more production. What were some of the ways that you found that you could successfully start producing or go after it more? Or what advice might you have for the rock stars about that? Sure. Um, I think it comes with becoming comfortable with the artists you're working with. Um, I did have some gigs in the early days where a really great producer friend of mine was too busy to take the gig. And he said, uh, I, I really recommend Chris to take this gig. Uh, and I even, uh, and that put me in a relationship with those guys to be like, okay, let's, uh, let's sit and talk about this record. And, and there's many times when the producer role is, isn't even seen until the record's over. And then the band is like putting out the credits for the record and they're like, okay, we're, we're giving you producer credits because I mean, obviously the artistic ideas that you came up with were uh, something that was very integral in the making of this record. Does it ever seem like the producer credits, it's like this, like this rarefied gold, you know, that is sort of like distributed well, you, um, tentatively amongst well, I, like, people or there's, something? There's been many times like you don't know that you've been credited with that until you go get the the CD or the or the album from the band and then you're like, well, sweet, they gave me the producer credit and 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 it validates like you feel like you put your heart and soul into it and and helped out creative yeah, yeah. In, in the creative aspect of that record. <laughs> what about on the front end of it? Um, can you think of any stories where you felt like you um, asked for 
a role on a record or ask, asked to participate or do something where you felt very nervous about it, like you really had to um, do a little bit of a leap? Like a as faith. a producer or? Any any aspect of, of your record-making career. Or just you, anxiety when starting Yeah, where you were like anxious to ask for the thing that you feel like you would like to have a shot at or rightfully deserve. Before the record or like post-record? Y- yeah, uh, both, both. I mean- Okay. Those are the most stressful parts sometimes about making records. And yeah. um, I think it's it's good to hear any uh, encouraging advice about any, any I mean, stories I've, about I've that. I've definitely had like anxiety going into records. I, I know I, I did a record with this bluegrass band that was phenomenal and a big producer coming in. And I just remember like just the night before the session, just having like this like mild anxiety attack on how I'm going to make this all happen. This was a record we were doing. Uh, completely to analog tape and a bluegrass record. So, uh, I mean, it went into Pro Tools post post tape, but but just like the anxiety of like sitting up that night before, like I'm routing everything in my head. I'm like, are you aligning the tape machine too? Uh, I never did that. No, we had a technician that came in and did that. I never got to that super tech side of the tape machine, and <clears throat> and you know we were in the in the 2000s where we probably weren't aligning the tape machine as as much as as we should have, or, right. you know, like it sounded cool. <laughs> um, but I remember like, yeah, just like nights sometimes before a session where I'm literally like just sitting in my head and re- routing the entire session, like in my head, how I'm going to, where I'm going to set them up, like what I'm going to run them through. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that can come with some anxiety of like just yeah. overthinking when all you have to do is go in the next day and get your, uh, uh, <laughs> get your uh, track sheet up and what you're going to run through and it, it all works out. But like, well, I mean, I, for for me, for example, one memory I have is working with um, Will Kimbrough was had asked me about doing a record, um, and so I, I I felt like I had a shot to engineer it, okay. but I really wanted to produce it, and I really was loved his music a lot. Sure. And I remember going through that like I really was nervous about it, but I finally just got up the the gumption and asked if I could produce it as well or sure. co-produce it or whatever, and. Um, and then, you know, he was like, cool with it. And he said, yeah. And then I, and I ended up being really proud about the way the record turned out. It really was a cool record. I loved it. And, you know, it was just, it was a, one of those example moments for me of like, sometimes you just got to push through that barrier of of the fear of asking for something that you want. Sure. And having it turn out to be great. S- sometimes just what you do in the studio will show your production credit as not being pushy, but like if you've you know, uh, get comfortable with the artist and producer you're working with. If, if they see like the producer says, I want this to happen, uh, the sound or this instrument and you quickly go do it. Like, um, so for example, I'm working with this band Fort Francis right now who they came in initially to work with me, uh, with a different producer from New York. And, uh, we kind of just built this great relationship and now they're in the studio with me and kind of cut out the producer and I'm producing the record. So Right. Well, yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. Sometimes you just build trust after you just get in there and help out in whatever way there is. Totally. And the trust is automatic. Yeah. Yeah. Especially um, with the artist, like more than anything. Like, yeah, if they see yeah. that you're just like in it and, and willing to do anything to make this awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. So another artist that I think you worked with was um, Corbin Andrick. Oh, cool. Jet- yeah. Jazz yeah. sax player. Yeah. yeah. And so um, I wondered what you learned about recording jazz records. Um, and in fact, there was another one you did, the District 97. Yeah. So, and I wondered if there were any parallels between recording jazz stuff and that. There just seemed to be. Where District, District 97 is so different, very prog. so different musically, but it yeah. was, but it was very like um, there was a uh, a purist quality to the recording as well. I thought uh, on the D97 stuff as well, huh? Yeah. yeah wow, yeah, that's so. that's really interesting. <laughs> I like to hear that. Um, yeah, Corbin and I have worked together for also like 10 years, uh, almost every project that, that Corbin has been on him and I have done records together on, um, when you track him, do you put musicians in headphones or no headphones? How do you like to approach that? <laughs> this is really funny because, uh, typically on headphones. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I, Corbin hates that I, uh, I put him in a, in a dead room, like, which usually works out. Cause if I have the drums in the live room, then I'll, I'll put him in. And it drives him crazy, uh, <laughs> which he brings up all the time. And we've we've kind of talked and tried to figure out different ways to do that. But uh, so him and I just went and made a, a record with his other band, AV Club, at Pachyderm uh, over. Uh, oh, cool, cool. Uh, uh, so I got to go back there many years later, which I've gone a couple times. But uh, uh, and they have like their isolation room is called like the Granite Room, so it's very reflective. Uh, and yeah. he just loved it because he he is a very 
he wants to hear a saxophone with with room to it. Right. But, he wants yeah. to he wants to sort of express the room and But have yeah, as we walls. as we tracked uh, Corbin's records, I think that yeah, he was isolated. I I find it difficult to do a jazz which I've done, but difficult to do a jazz record with the drums with everyone in the same room without headphones because it just gets like you know, the drums kind of take everything over and They do. Yeah, and it's it's hard to be happy at the end of the day with that 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 horn sound when there's like some snare drum, yeah. you know, popping in I there. just like, did one recently that actually turned out quite well, but it was, um, I mean, it's a challenge and it's like, you can't unglue an instrument from another one. You, it's like everybody's either working together just right. You can't. Yeah. Also it was in this particular one. Um, so rock says, if you want to check out the record, it is the blue hour, uh, by Anthony Matula. And we tracked it with no headphones, everything all in one space. Yeah. Um, including vocals. Awesome. And but the but it's a drummer record, so it was okay that the drums really were, were a big deal, you know. Everything, yeah, yeah, which it was, was like cool. The drummer wrote, composed the the, the arrangements and everything. Yeah, yeah. So like, if I had done Max Roach's record, <laughs> I didn't. I I did get to shake Max Roach's hand once. That's awesome. Times, yeah. Like, all right. So um, and then District ninety seven. Talk more about what that music's all about. Wow, those guys are crazy. Um, they're super talented, talented young kids. Uh, and I'm just getting ready. Yeah, next week or the week after to start their fourth record. Um, so I've worked on every record they've made uh, and co-produced uh, each record that they have made with uh, Jonathan Shang, the drummer who uh, started out, uh, I think the first record or the first two, Jonathan, the drummer, wrote everything, like literally down to the notes for the guitar player. I mean, for everything, uh, minus maybe the vocal melodies, but uh he wrote well. Didn't Neil Pert write all the lyrics for Rush? Uh, I uh, I think he may be right, uh, but I think Jonathan would be very happy to hear you compare him to M- Neil Pert. But uh, um, yeah, so those records have always been two kind of getting the live tracks down as they're. I think we'll do sections to click, but they have so many time signature changes and so many things that like kind of need to breathe a little bit. Uh, I think at one point we talked about tempo mapping their their stuff, but. But Jonathan's a great drummer, and we've pulled it off to where it's just been solid with him just being the backbone for for the record. And maybe it starts out to a click so he can kind of get a tempo and then kind of turn it off at some yeah. point when the time signatures change and and he goes into crazy different things. Um, but yeah, with those guys, we would track basic tracking, usually try and keep a bunch of keys, some guitars, um, but mostly, and bass and drums. Um, but that those records are... Very big production, so it's pretty much kind of stripped down to some of the keys we'll keep and uh, drums and bass and start to build those up afterwards um, as far as the guitars are just so huge on those records and so many parts and also the keyboards. There's some songs will have organ, piano, synths, uh, just multiple, multiple keyboards on them, and they're just very crazy, intricate records and uh, yeah, we just kind of connected on the idea of of having me produce them. I think the first record, uh, my business partner, Manny Sanchez, had started the record, and then I kind of took over or helped out in the, the guitar and vocal world after the basics were tracked. Um, and just, once again, built a great relationship with those guys, and they kind of really respected my... So now long songs in these? Yeah, some of them are like, yeah, there's can be a 12-minute song. I think <laughs> one of the records is... The first, either the first or the end of the record is like a 26 minute song. And so when you're tracking this stuff, you're, you've got like a guitar, keyboard, vocal, maybe just sort of guiding you along. Sure. But really you're focused on just getting the drums. Drums and, and bass, the bass are kind right. of the most important with those guys. Yeah. To get those takes. And we'll even do it in sections. Like, and Jonathan's great at like planning that, that out, like to where if there's a crazy tempo change, he knows that. And we'll we'll look at that as far as like where the symbol hits are going to end and where the next section will start to see how we can, because it, if it's a twenty eight minute song, uh, twenty eight minutes. I, there was one, yeah, one song on one of their records that was like twenty eight minutes long. It was crazy. Man, uh, and that's almost as long as this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit longer. Um, so uh, maybe not with those guys or not. It doesn't have to be specific. But how often in your world might you still break out something like Beat Detective and Pro Tools and, and manipulate drums or that's, that's a great, flexible audio and stuff like that? It's a great question. Um, when I first started, you know, uh, over a decade ago that was just like extremely common in like learning from some producers that I worked with, uh, that you just like had to be detective stuff. I, I think over the last three years, um, 
I've given it up. Like I just can't, it, I feel like it takes the life out of everything. Um, and I've really tried so super hard to not do it. Um, of course I'll grab like a, a take from something else and, you know, I'm going to grab a chorus from this maybe and, and, and the verse from this, but I just, I can't do it anymore. Like it, it kind of like, it sucked my soul out. Like, yeah. like, and I would feel, I would feel upset when I like got done beat detective being <laughs> a, uh, an entire song of drums and yeah. we would do it. But, and I, I just feel like, Did, do you ever remember having the sense that once you go down that road, it's a slippery slope and like, then you have to do that. You seem to have to over manipulate manipulate everything else that gets added to it. Absolutely. I mean, it can go there. I, I I know too. Like on a record, this was even like eight or nine years ago. This drummer was unbelievable, but I was in the mindset that like I had to like make it perfect. Like yeah. it was all to click, and 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 I like sat and just was freaking out about. It. I got I got to beat detective this guy, and 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 at the end of the day, I didn't do it, and the record is so amazing because of it like yeah, I let it nice. and the drummer was amazing what am i trying to do be detective uh i think the only instance nowadays i'll i'll go to that is if it's gonna be something that's like super tight with loops and or right. or drum or you know uh, right samples. in that case the the kicks and snares might have to land yeah in so with, if it's a if it's an electronic thing yeah. uh with some Rock, so i don't know if you're the train in the background we'll go beat awesome. detective that thing <laughs> yeah, that'd um be great. yes uh, but i've been oh. trying to stay away from it i just feel like uh even if it's not perfect, like it now just feels better to me and it has more soul. And if it pushes and pulls a little bit, that's the band. That's the way they sound. But then you've got something like, uh, you know, Matt Gaiden, um, original Nashville Cat Session player, guitar player, was on the podcast earlier. And he's, you know, make it, talking about making records with J.J. Kale. And he walks in and J.J. Kale's got one of the first drum machines. Okay. And now you've got this drum machine beat but like all the acoustic loose elements all around it. And it's so funny how like, it's just another example. I was like, the moment you think there's a rule, then you look at it and you're like, oh wait, there really isn't a rule about that. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the number one thing with our job is that there isn't rules. Like you should That's experiment. the number one rule? Well, yeah, the, there isn't rules. <laughs> rule number one, uh, read rule number zero. <laughs> all right, so um, let's see, uh, bump us all the people. Oh, sweet. Yeah. That was some, uh, I think, uh, old school stuff for you. Real cool funk band. Yeah. Um, amazing funk band, which. Unique sound, kind of crunchy and, yeah. and kaboingy in cool ways. Um, How has recording evolved for you in the past decade between that and, and now? Uh, I might even throw in a suggestion that some of the newer stuff, it's almost like I've heard you, if, that's a, if that exists, like. The newer stuff has a, um, there's an expertise of how to handle room and space around things now sure. here too. Yeah. But, um, yeah. What, what would you like to say about those? Yeah. Bumpus was amazing. Um, and uh, not to branch off on something else, but like working with those guys, they had like 13 people in their band, which branched out to be so many different records for me, like as that evolves. Oh, that's know. good advice right there. Go you know, make it the first band you record, the one with as many members in it as possible. <laughs> well, like Corbin Andrick, who we talked about earlier, uh, was a horn player in that band and has gone on to, I've done so many projects with him. Um, but yeah, so I think it's just doing it and, and experimenting and learning. And I think your ears get better as you uh, do it more and more. And once you start mixing and understanding more about frequencies and space, um, it just, it comes together. It's, it's, no one's going to jump into the world of an audio engineering and be awesome right away. Like you, you have to have that time to figure out in your brain and your ears, what is appealing to you. And I, I feel like that's something that yeah. has happened for me over time. Of course, like any engineer, I think. Yeah. And I feel like there are tricks and methods and ways to handle things that fix and remove stuff we don't like, yeah. but we only really acquire it by encountering all these things. And then one by one, picking up little techniques and, you know, totally. And I mean, I'm still doing it all the time. It's, you know? This, this, uh, industry is such a, a learning process that blows me away because I, learn something new every single day. And I, I feel like there's a lot of jobs where you're, sitting in a cubicle punching in numbers or something like that, you're not going to learn anything really. You're just dictating some numbers into a, a, a system. But uh, No disrespect to the number crunchers. <laughs> My dad's an accountant. Sorry, dad. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just feel like you get to learn so much all the time. 
that uh, every day in the studio is a learning experience. And if sometimes I love to go crazy, like just do set up three super weird mics that are that might sound like total shit. But when you go to mix it, you're like, holy cow, that one is just so money right now. Like it's it's exactly what I needed for this section of the song. Yeah. Uh, oh, definitely. I mean, I've had situations where like the drum comes and we've got a drum break and then I just muted everything except for the two room mics and then re-squashed them and it's like this course. perfect thing. Yeah. And I mean, it's great when you, you know, perfectly discover that in the tracking stage, but that's a lot to hope for sometimes, you know, sure. sometimes it's, it's great to find that out later. And, and another lesson I feel like I learn is that it's okay to record a bit too many mics in the recording stage. Don't go overboard because it's just going to be a like a you know, later, like yeah. a weight around your neck while you're trying to work. Yeah, but a little bit of like an extra mic that you really don't need in the drum sound, but you might just break it out for one section could be cool. Sure. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, just sometimes experiment and and maybe not even spend any time on that microphone. Like throw it up, boom, and then you go to mix and you're like, yes, yeah. <laughs> experiment experiment um so uh we have a mutual friend michael mcdermott oh that's right yeah share man. some stories about working and making music with with michael oh, i was awesome yeah uh mike came into our studio to uh do his hit me back record um he was working with a producer i'm trying to remember uh, i'm really terrible i should remember some that. producer with <laughs> some name <laughs> it was, come back to he, he was great um but yeah mike is just awesome man just like such a great songwriter and I just remember, uh, yeah, getting some acoustic guitar sounds on that record as far as like, he's one of those people too that like just picked up a guitar and just sounded beautiful. Uh, oh, but yeah, yeah he's was, got the the kind of smoky rock and roll voice tone too. He that's does. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, Heather Horton, uh, his wife is uh, a great friend as well and has sang on many Chicago Farmer records and I'll, I'll have her sing on a lot of different stuff as uh, records come up where I'm like, oh, I need that. Well, she can do so many things, but if I need that like Emmy Lou thing that's like kind of twangy, she can come in and just kill it. Uh, yeah, both those guys I've worked with them here and they're great. Oh, uh, they're awesome. Yeah, great, great friends. Stars. Like I, I still see them when I toured with Ike Riley, uh uh Mike would open up for some gigs or or play different gigs with them and yeah, just uh, great people. I love them to death. Um and uh yeah, funny stories about that. Like I somehow ended up like singing on that record and that might have been one of those instances where i was like singing a harmony like uh in the control room when i shouldn't have been <laughs> and then they're like that yeah, sounds good get out on yeah, mic yeah and then michael had me uh sing some stuff on that record so <laughs> all future interns ignore what we just exactly said. Yeah, don't do sing not, in do the not. control room no don't do not that. until after a few months well yeah be very comfortable with the artist before you do something like that or the producer <laughs> um cool all right, so let's jump to our, our usual jam session questions and, and kind of roll out. When sure. you started out in recording and doing this music thing, what was holding you back? Did you lose the the power supply for your four track or <laughs> anything else? It's so funny. Um, I still have the four track and the power supply. Uh, but um, no, I, I would say more than anything, just confidence. Like just like knowing, uh, I think it took getting thrown into bigger situations to and and accomplishing them to get the confidence to then work with other artists you know like when i was working with uh, my business partner manny who was the owner at the time and uh and getting thrown into a situation where manny couldn't be there and i had to work with a bigger artist and you're stressing out and you're freaking out but but just getting thrown into it and and doing it i think helps you with your confidence to to allow you to uh then continue to work with other artists and and be confident when you walk in rather than than nervous or scared yeah. true you just gotta like wring out all the nerves as soon as possible yeah I'm a lot more relaxed about stuff these days, but there are plenty of things that I do get stressed out. I, I, you I just replace say, them I, with new stuff, right? I, I try to be too. I think uh, recording engineering adds a lot of uh, there's just there's anxiety involved with it a lot. Like when a when there is a timeline to finish something and yeah. and and figuring out how to make it happen. Uh, there's I don't think you're ever gonna not be anxious. Uh, well, there's, there's the anxiety about getting it right on the way in. And there's like, you know, because so much of music is a moment. Yeah. And if you screw it up, the moment is missed and that part sucks. Yeah. And then there's also the anxiety about having screwed up and like, you know, being worried that, that you screwed up. And like, it's so funny. Like I, I was meeting with a friend of mine, a producer who I'd done a record with, and it was like a year after we did the record. 
and we're talking about, I was like, oh yeah, how'd it turn out? It's, you know, so great. And I'm all, I'm super pumped. And then he's like, oh, it turned out great. He was like, he was like, oh, but man, I was really struggling because, you know, you recorded it and there was no bottom mic on the snare. And I'm my whole, like my whole mood just went, like, oh Ooh. yeah. You're like, huh, I, I will never, that will never happen again. <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, dude. And then he played me the stuff. He said he struggled on the mixes, but then he played it for me. And I'm like, this sounds fucking great. Yeah. So then you're like back to like, well, you know, sometimes in music, it's the challenge of like having to solve a problem that ends up making it all sound so cool in the end. I think a huge part of it too is to have people to lean on. Um, as far as like the anxiety part, like I just finished a mix the other day and I have unbelievable business partners. Uh, Shane Hendrickson and uh, uh, Rowan Weary are, and and that's kind of the nice part about being at a larger studio is that like kind of uh, my close friends and business partners are always around. Like, and I finished a mix the other day and I was just like, man, you know, I'm just... I don't know about this part. Like, like come in and just come in and take a listen to it. And then uh, both Rowell and Shane came and listened in and like, whoosh, like opened up a couple ideas that just I was not thinking about and, and like made yeah. my mix a million times better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, always look for advice from everywhere you can. I mean, that was, uh, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's it's, just great advice. I think uh, Mitch Dane just shared that, in fact, where he was talking about, you know, look to others for help in every aspect of what you're doing because totally. it's always there. And no matter where you're at with your skill set, there's always a next level and you can um, learn something valuable from somebody that is more skilled than you or even less skilled than uh, you. Yeah, I was going to say you know? like, yeah, and maybe not even more skilled than you, but like it's just a different perspective. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, very cool. All right, so now um, how about sharing some of the best advice you remember receiving? Oh man, best thing. Anything advice. popping into mind? Um, let's see. Get out of this business now, kid. <laughs> I best advice, um, I'd probably say, and I don't remember who told me this, um, but use your ears. Right. Like I think that too often these days, uh, especially younger kids coming up, everything is done visually by looking at the screen and, right. and there's something uh amazing about shutting the screen off for a second and and like closing your eye. also learned from another producer that i worked with like he would just sit intently with his eyes closed and i think i picked that up at some point because it's just like it gives you a moment to like almost meditative like to like listen to it fully and not visualize what like and even when i like you'll make some crazy edit these days that you're like like ah that doesn't sound right to me you know and it, it comes down to like you looking at it like if you see the edit happening then you're it freaks you out yeah and you're screwed but like the minute you turn the computer off and like just li listen to the speakers you're like the edit's totally fine that's why i like to work so fast in pro tools that everybody else in the room has no idea what i'm doing <laughs> that sounds awesome they're like can you fix that bass part i was like yeah i just did didn't you hear it He's like, <laughs> yeah. what what um all right so uh <laughs> Little pat. I'm gonna pat myself on the back. Yeah, there, there you go, Lich. Um, all right, so we've already talked about lots of recording tips. Um, unless you had anything else that you you felt like we wanted to share that we didn't. Uh, but I will I will jump yeah. to the next question. All right, so uh, any hardware tools for the studio that you're excited about right now? Anything new you're messing with or, or having fun with? Oh man, I, that's I hardware tools. I was gonna go back to like old school because it's just yeah. Because like, you're talking about uh, you're using a distressor, console, distressor, distressor, and, a, and, yeah. a, and 1176. Man, like if I could, like yeah. Well, the Chandler TG1 too. You're talking about that. that so there that you is go. amazing too. Yeah, I, I yeah, I love I love real compressors. I, I think that the plug-in world has come a long freaking way compared yeah, to, to what it was no 10 doubt. years ago. Um, well, let's go straight there. How about software tools? Any, any plugins you've been excited about? I mean, lately? always sound toys. Like I, yeah. I, I couldn't make records without sound okay. toys. Every single one of those plugins or uh, some just, favorites? I mean, like Echo Boy, Decapitator. Like, I knew you were going to say Echo Boy, <laughs> Decapitator. I, it's just like, it's going to be my first uh, delay. Like if I, if I'm going to like, how about the stay level? Uh, the state like as a hardware? No, the the uh, sound toys. Oh, I don't think I've ever used their. Oh, you might not have that one. Yeah, we we have we have a hardware version at the studio. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I've never used the the digital version. Um. Okay. So, uh, what are some? Let's see. The 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 uh, the Echo Boy. What's the other one? The uh, the crystallizer. I don't I, use that as much, but I'm trying to. I'm always I always feel, feel like I, I should be using it. I more. use it like uh, I was just I just mixed a thing for a band from Philadelphia that, uh. They were done tracking, and he sent it sent it to me to mix, and it was kind of more of a, a home studio type type uh, recording situation. 
And he was like, well, we really want like some organ on that. So if you want to play some organ or do something like that, like on this particular song. And what did I do? I took the guitar track, uh, uh, duplicated it and threw some crystallizer on it. And, and all of a sudden I had somewhat of a, an organ track. Yeah. Like. <laughs> it's always a little weird, right? It reminds me of the H, um, was it the H three thousand, right? The, sure. The, Old harmonizer. The harmonizer, yeah, and there would be like silica beads in those <laughs> settings in there, where I'd get to it and I'd hear it and I'd be like, "I'm like, what the hell is this? What am I supposed? I don't know what to do with that." It's funny though. I do hear like I can hear crystallizer now. Like on if I hear somebody else's record, I'm like, "Yeah, oh, yeah." There's the crystallizer. Yeah, but maybe there's Brad Wood. I think said that too on his <laughs> his interview. That's funny. I, I think it's you, I, Chicago guys. Oh yeah. I think uh, I think Sound Toys crushes it, and and they're so analog sounding delays that yeah uh, I agree yeah, the, the and, Echo and Boys effects. yeah yeah it, you get the whole bundle just for Echo Boy and I mean I'll throw Decapitator on my drum to to mix like in okay so on the so the the complete drum to mix you might throw Decapitator on and just a tiny bit yeah just like three or four bit. kind of dirty is it one of those things bit? where you usually go a little too far and then you back it up a little bit later on in the mix sure I mean I I think I've uh, we talked a lot about analog mixing, which uh, over the last probably six months to a year, I've, you know, as as the world evolves and you have to recall everything and don't want to spend eight hours printing stems after you're done with a right. a, a hundred track uh, mix that we've all kind of moved over to the digital world and and uh, yeah, so like my drum two mix after I've almost done the exact same thing that I do on the analog board uh, through uh, parallel compression, uh, I have an all drums fader that's a bus that is gonna i usually put decapitator on it and it's just usually like three or four but yes like maybe blow it up a little too much and then bring it back but it's just finding that like when we did everything in the analog world there was there was grit there was tubes yeah. there was things that were doing things uh to kind of like add the, that uh, like bump us all the people yeah it's got well, a little bit of crunch going yeah, on absolutely you know? yeah yeah that that was uh Unbelievable mix too by a guy Mike Zirkel. Uh, we went up to Smart Studios and, and mixed that record. That oh, was Smart's great. I uh, spent some time there too. It's awesome. Um, okay, and then would you? So you you said three or four is maybe the the gain part the, of the, the knob. dirt level. I think that's and the then left and knob. then you'd still use the blend or you might be all the way. I'm pretty much point. mix kind of all the way and okay, then just right, use the, the left knob, which I think is the the dirt or the. Yeah, I feel like there's two ways that I might approach something like that. I might think. Okay, I need to go for kind of extreme because this is going to be parallel and then back down the mix thing. And yeah, those, the, you know, the blend knobs are so, they've become such an intrinsic part of plugins now. But <laughs> yeah. I still, my brain is still confused by how to actually do it for some reason. I, don't I know try not dummy. to go there. I try not to go to the mix. Knob. I feel like I'd rather just put it on a parallel track and bring it in on its own fader somehow. I don't know sure. why that is. Yeah, I mean, and and as I'm doing this parallel compression with the drums, I don't think I touch the mix knob, but I just add the dirt, like one, two, three, four, like and see how it feels. I, I use it on horns all the time, like like to oh, cool. dirt, dirty up horns. And- no, I'm gonna breaking out my distressor even more now. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So now, how about uh, a resource or tip for the business side of doing this? Anything, any advice you want to share with the rock stars or anything, you know, maybe some uh, online tool I'm, that you, you find really useful for the business side? I know you guys have a great website for your, your yeah, studio Yeah, well. I'm terrible at the business side. Uh, we've had a, a studio manager for years and he's been like, I, I couldn't operate without him. And we just lost him, unfortunately. He just uh, moved on to another position. Uh, Mike, I love you. You're the best in the world. <laughs> um, but but I, I mean, maybe that's part of the answer too, is maybe you found that it was helpful to partner up with some other people so that you could have one kind of home base hub studio and one person to help absolutely manage that stuff absolutely you know, like he, yeah he would do the business side of it and run the numbers like i kind of have no interest in that like it's it's it sucks i don't want to be the one and now that, that our studio manager is gone um we're starting to have to like kind of pick up the slack on that as far as like you know, punching in stuff at the end of a session. And it's tough because sometimes at the end of a 14-hour day, you're just... You're toast. You're wiped, man. And you don't really have the mental capacity to go into a computer and enter all the proper information you need to for the payment of that session. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and then that would be, um, do you uh, find it helpful to have like a central hub, like a, a shared studio space that is collecting money for the studio as well as for you as the producer engineer? Or do you like, do you find it more... more situations where you separate those two things or I, I mean in my am I not allowed to ask that question <laughs> no I mean in my situation I like to have uh, a collective I mean it's it we all help out on the bottom line or the the nut if you will of what needs to be covered to make our studio possible and in this day of 
of larger studios closing down every second. Um, and do you guys all send tips to the back of the kitchen as well? <laughs> <laughs> we need a kitchen. That'd be a great idea. Oh, but what's the beer situation like at your studio? Um, well, Please say I, top notch. I, I bring many growlers from the, from the brewery to Excellent. the studio Excellent. while we're recording. I, I typically leave the brewery to go do a, a, a session at the, at the studio. So yeah. I know where we'll be doing our next session in Chicago. Please come. We'd love to have you. <laughs> um, all right. So what about uh, anything organizational? Sort of like a, maybe there's some way that online thing or, or just some method in the studio that helps you keep all your shit together. I would say it's something I've used for like the last like eight, nine, 10 years is a, a synchronized pro. Just a, right. a, a backup program. Um, and uh, I've recently had an issue with that too. And I learned something very valuable. Uh, one day after one of those days where it was a very, very, very long session and I was kind of, you know, spent, um, I reversed my sink. So instead uh, of sh- doing my master to my backup, I, re- I sink, sunk my backup to, uh, or excuse me, I sunk my master from my backup and deleted about five hours worth of work. Oh man! So, um, but I learned something very valuable through that. Is that uh, Synchronized Pro? If you go into it's either the f- edit menu or something, there is an archive function, and so anything that it erases from something that it's going to it delete, will archive, right? It will put in a folder of your choosing where you want it, and that was huge. Uh, but Synchronized Pro has been a huge thing for me because obviously you know the idea of once you're working on three different drives and making sure they're all up to date on what what's happening with the overdubs on. Day, this day to and I try and go to when I'm done with a session I back it up in two other places and then I feel comfortable so let's talk about that one step further so uh, there are many options uh, synchronized pro I'm using chronosync as one uh-huh. I'm also using time machine now yeah. in the Mac I figured I'd finally take advantage of this <laughs> right. built-in thing right and uh and for me in that case I actually um, have like three sort of work like a system and two you know, content drives. And then the fourth drive is just like four terabytes or something like sure. that for the time machine so yeah. that it can hold all three of those drives and kind of cycle. And it's more like a temporary thing. And then I'll have two a- external drives and move things to those and then use the chronosync to kind of back one to the other. Yeah. But my point is, and, and <laughs> oh, what did we used to have? We used to have the thing with the tape machines where you'd have to like swap out these little dat tape things all night oh, long sure. yeah. and it in sleep in the control room so that you could keep up with them. <laughs> that Speaking or like, smart or studios. the first days of, of, uh, pro tools where the only way to back up what you had like overdub that day was to import session data to the other session. Oh man. So like you would be like, Oh, okay. So I, you would take notes and you were like, we added this many instruments, blah, 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 blah. And you would have to open the session from your backup drive and then import session data. Crazy. Wow. Wow. Just because of space on drives and everything. Well, too. that, and I just never trust it. Like it, it said you could like replace this previous folder that was there. Oh, right, right. But, totally, yeah. But you're yeah. not going to trust that. Like, right. You know, totally. It, it was before I knew about synchronized pro. It was like, that was well, the way you backed up. So my question is, um, learning lessons about like, these are all useful tools. Oh, and, and, uh, Backblaze is another one that gets I mentioned a lot. I just heard on, about like when I, I hit up some engineers after that, uh, malfunction happened to me and my, my buddy was like, I just started Backblaze five bucks a month. Like do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got to talk to those guys. <laughs> they probably make a good sponsor for the podcast. Yeah, there you what go. do you think, Rockstars? <laughs> so, um, but with each of these, there's always, no matter how convenient, there's always some level of complexity that once you know that now you learned it much better. Sure. And, um, I don't really know where I'm going with this other than to say that I feel like you kind of have to, it's like many other things. You have to just adopt it, start doing it, and then you will encounter that one obstacle and you'll learn it. Now you're just one step further, but you never get there unless you were willing to take that first step and accept and get, and that you it. might, that you might still run into problems down the road. You sure. Know? Yeah. I mean, and, and, and learning every day, just like, when I messed up and it was completely my fault and I took ownership of it, I just hit the wrong button, you know, like, right. that, and that can happen. Um, and, and realizing that we did that too on a record where full days worth of vocals. Yeah. That was, it was three we days, deleted, or, or, just, excuse me, like, uh, three songs of lead vocals that I just, but we were doing it. We weren't using a, um, a software app. We were just simply doing the drag and drop one hard drive to another replace. And um, we had opened up and started working on the session on the backup drive by accident. Sure. So at the end of the day, when we copied from the master to the backup, we just copied right over it's, it. It's a digital world we live in. We got we to gotta 
keep our ducks in a row because digital you, dummies. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's uh, let's jump right back to our uh, final question, and this is a um, hypothetical one, but we're gonna take the way back studio machine. You're gonna go back and find young Chris Harden um, getting ready to trade in his trumpet for a four track. And uh, you, you walk into the music store, uh, you know, the bell goes ding, ding, ding on the little front door as you walk in. And then you go up and, and uh, tap yourself on the shoulder at the checkout counter. Young Chris turns around and says, what are you doing here, dude, with the with a beard? That's, <laughs> that's what, What's your beard? It's like, you got, you got some distinguishing grays appearing, right? White, white versus... Brand. It's the beer that does yeah. it, right? Um, but uh, yeah, you said, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. Before you trade your trumpet in for that four track, here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Man, that's a extremely tough question. Uh, basically, uh, I'm just fucking long-winded. I wanted to tell that story. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm i kind of like the believer that everything happens for, the re- for a reason and, and you do your path that you need to do and... I would just go back and tell myself to build relationships. Like that's the number one thing I think in this business. Uh, the only way that you're going to succeed is that you build great relationships with artists and they keep coming back to work with you. If you, if, uh, yeah, I don't know if you're, that's just to me the most important thing, like just building relationships, become friends with the artists, like make them comfortable. And if you find Rockstar is a band that you get a chance to work with and they have something like all the people in the name of the band that might imply that there's a lot of people in the band record them because then they're going to know all these other people and branch off to 15 different records. Yeah. Yeah. You might as well just like, you know, it's a, it's a game of odds and averages. (laughs) Right. So, uh, Chris, thanks so much for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us. An absolute pleasure to have you here in the studio. Such a pleasure, Lish. Thank I you so much. I look forward to enjoying a beer with you yeah. as soon as possible. Let the Rockstars know how they can find you online, follow you, learn more about you. Uh, cool. Uh, just ivylabstudios.com. Uh, letter I, letter V, Victor, L-A-B, uh, studios, ivylabstudios.com. And uh, I've got an Instagram, but it's just going to be pictures of my young daughter, uh, uh, and Chris Harden on Facebook. Uh, yeah, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, it's Chris at IvyLabStudios.com is my email address if you have any questions or or anything. Dig like it. I, and I, last yeah. name Harden, H-A-R-D-E-N. That is correct. And I'm very uh, very happy with your pronunciation. That's that's very great. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> um, we have some Hardens in our family, but oh, uh, but different different spelling. Yeah. Which I won't say because I don't want to confuse people. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks again for being here on the show. Rockstars, remember, we've got show notes to everything we're talking about. Just click through um, and you can learn more about Chris. Uh, if you're on your mobile device, click through. If you want to go to the website, rsrockstars.com, use the magnifying glass, search Chris Harden. It'll take you there. YouTube playlist to go listen to some of these records awesome. um, and, and link you right through to Chris's studio. And then last but not least, if you're interested in learning about more about mixing yourself and you're in a DAW, Go take my free mix training at mixmasterbundle.com, where I teach you how to mix using free stock plugins in any DAW. That is awesome. It's one of my instrumental tracks. Ah, Lish, thanks so much for having me. Uh, what a pleasure to be here in Nashville. And uh, I've listened to so many episodes of the podcast and learned so much. So I appreciate you doing what you do. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Thanks for coming, dude. <laughs> Cheers. See you around the studio. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.